Yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. How's everyone today? <coughs> My name is Danielle McNichol, and I'm general counsel at Newman University and director for the Center for Leadership. Thank you all for coming today um, for today's topic, which is elder care promoting and protecting the rights of the elderly. Uh, we're thankful to all of our partners uh, who are here uh, for the Chamber of Commerce, Trish McFarland. We have Bellevue Communications with Pete Peterson, Nancy Caramanico, Ryan McDonald, and we'd also like to thank the Apple Walnut uh, Cafe for all of the great treats that they always provide to us every time. Um, a few of the just quick housekeeping items. The restrooms are out to your right. Um, so if you'll just come out of these doors, go to the right, and the restrooms are there. Don't get nervous inside there. They are motion um, lights in there, so it'll just take a couple of seconds for the lights to go on, but I assure you they will go on. Um, for today, we have applied for three CLE credits uh, for, the, uh, for the elder care presentation. The uh, forms are out front. If you'd like to fill those forms out, we'll be sending them into the Bar Association. The Bar Association will then be sending to you um, a form and the price for the number of credits that um, you are interested in, in receiving, and then they'll process it accordingly. But we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to make this an opportunity for everyone to be able to attend, so we have um, made all of our CLE programming moving forward free and available to everyone in the public. Um, the other item that I'd like to mention and I would like to put in a special plug about is the Suiting for Success and Technology uh, program that we have. This program um, is near and dear to, I think, a lot of folks' hearts. Uh, we are asking for people with gently worn suits and professional clothing uh, to donate the clothing. Uh, there are there's a box out front here in the Miranda Center, in the Bachman Center. There's one in the uh, Rock of Abyssinia building here at Newman, as well as, the as well as the Chamber. And the clothing will be available to uh, individuals that are entering or re-entering the workforce uh, in their professional career. So we'll give those, uh, those clo the clothing will be available to veterans, to returning caregivers, uh, to students, and to people that uh, need those to continue their success uh, from an employment perspective. So we would really ask if you could take some time to go into your closet and you can fill out that clothing and also your used technology. Um, we'll be refurbishing those. Actually, we're uh, partnering with Verizon to refurbish the uh, technology and we'll be able to provide technology to folks that need that to, to apply for jobs. So we appreciate everyone's um, you know, uh, consideration during the holiday season. And again, we're, we're a not-for-profit, 501c3. So whatever donation you provide, we'll be happy to provide you with a receipt for that as well. Uh, we'll continue to run the program again in the spring, uh, but the donations will be accepted through about December 18th. And then beginning in January, we will start the opportunity for folks to come in to uh, actually receive the, the different kinds of suits they may need for, uh, for uh, interviews. So with that being said, we would like to start uh, today's programming. We, would, uh, we have a very uh, distinguished group here today, so I appreciate everyone's time. Our first speaker is Delaware County District Attorney Jack Whalen who's been a tireless advocate for Delaware County residents and elder law. With more than 550,000 residents in Delaware County, District Attorney Whalen has also previously served as the chair of the Delaware County Council, partnering in many crime prevention initiatives, including the Senior Exploitation Unit, State School Summit, the, the Delaware County Veterans Justice Initiative, and the Heroin Task Force. Delaware County is lucky to have a person like District Attorney Whalen, and Newman University is proud to have him as an adjunct professor here. So at this time, we would like to welcome District Attorney Whalen. Thank you, David. <laughs> because I'm losing my voice, I'm going to keep my comments short, but certainly I'll be around today for questions that come up uh, for anyone. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about the District Attorney's Office, because I know I see some new faces out there, individuals that we probably haven't interacted with uh, over the course of my tenure in the District Attorney's Office. I'm completing my fifth year. I'm term limited. Uh, in Delaware County, people don't realize that um, all the row offices are term limited. Unlike any other county in Pennsylvania, we have 67 counties in Pennsylvania. Delaware County is the only county where the District Attorney 
is term limited. And I'm all for term limits, by the way. Um, I, uh, I believe that uh, there's a lot of great people out there that can serve in the capacity that I serve and can do as good of a job as I do and be dedicated to the residents of Delaware County. So term limits give people an opportunity, other people to serve uh, the, the residents in Delaware County. So I'm for it in legislative positions and uh, also subject to it. But as indicated, there's 550,000 people in Delaware County that the Office of the District Attorney and our Criminal Investigation Division serves. Uh, these, ind these individual offices are broken down into two components of our office. We have our Criminal Investigation Division and we have our attorneys, which is our prosecutorial unit. I can tell you that there are basically, it's divided into the prosecutors and the investigators. We have our own police department in the office of the district attorney. A lot of people don't realize that also. And what our police department does is that we help all the municipal police departments. We have, surprisingly, 43 separate police departments just here in Delaware County, 43 separate police departments, and that includes our Pennsylvania State Police that patrols the western section of the county. Of these 42 police departments, these municipal police departments, our criminal investigation division goes out and assists them. A lot of people don't also understand in the office of the district attorney that we have the ultimate responsibility of in criminal law. For example, if a police officer makes an arrest, but we think it's inappropriate for that arrest, we don't think that there's probable cause, there's insufficient evidence, or the police officer shouldn't have done that, well then what we can do is throw out the charges and dismiss the case before it even gets far in the criminal justice system. Uh, the police officers don't have the ultimate authority. The ultimate authority comes from the office of the district attorney. In the same light, if the police officer says, I don't want to handle that case or I don't want to arrest that person, maybe that person victimized a senior citizen, but the police officer doesn't think that there's enough evidence against this particular person, we can independently review it. We can take that over. We can look at it and we can say, it doesn't matter what the police department wants to do. We'll, we can separately arrest and charge that individual. We have that authority. So the ultimate authority for prosecution of cases, for the administration in the criminal justice system is in the office of the district attorney. Now, we have a great relationship with the 43 separate police departments in Delaware County, but unlike Philadelphia, and unlike Pittsburgh, I have to deal with 42 uh, separate chiefs of police. And some of those chiefs of police have <coughs> different ideas. Uh, some of them have different opinions. Some of them have uh, different mentalities. And so you have to work through that and be able to deal with all of that uh, in the prosecution of these cases. We have a rather extensive office. Unfortunately, one of the sad statistics is we're probably the third highest in crime uh, in the state of Pennsylvania only third to Philadelphia, which is number one, as you may expect, Pittsburgh being number two, and then Delaware County being number three. And what we're doing is we're processing over 10,000 cases a year when you look at our juvenile cases as well as our adult cases. Our adult cases come to around $9,000, uh, 9,000 9, cases a year, which deal with felony and misdemeanor cases. Now, Shortly after coming into office, we had already established uh, through uh, District Attorney Mike Green, who's now a judge, what we call our Senior Exploitation Unit. And that's a unit that was there to protect our senior citizens. But one of the, thing I, one of the things I noticed when I came into office is there was a lot of crimes against the elderly occurring. And we only had one detective, and he was spread pretty thin. He was doing a lot of educational seminars. He was also responsible for uh, investigating and prosecuting to, to the extent that the cases were turned over to our um, prosecutors in our office and I'm going to introduce a few people in a couple of minutes but what we um, saw at that point in time is just was insufficient so what we did is we expanded our senior exploitation unit and the way we explained, expanded it is we took our senior exploitation unit and we consolidated it with our white collar crime unit and some of the detectives are here and you're going to hear from some of the detectives today uh, in our white collar crime unit. And the purpose of that was most of the crimes dealing with the elderly that you're going to hear about today are fraud crimes, crimes involving economic situations where we're taking advantage of the senior citizens. The criminals are preying on the senior citizens. And so no better place than to take our white collar detectives, detectives that are specialists 
in dealing with subpoenas for bank records, dealing with the issues of trying to put together an economic case, which is much different than putting together an assault case. So you need a tedious, um, dedicated detective that's going to be able to subpoena all the records, outline it, put it in an Excel spreadsheet, and then be able to analyze all of that information to determine whether or not the senior was a victim and how she, she or he was victimized. We have one of the largest white collar crime units in the state of Pennsylvania. And so by taking the senior exploitation unit and putting it in that particular unit, now we have seven, eight detectives that are now serving our senior citizens and working on these cases on a regular basis. Now it's a, it's a, it's a shame that we have that type of uh, situation where we need so many detectives, but it's important for our seniors. And it's important to make sure that they don't become victims. Unfortunately also is many of the people that victimize our seniors are known to our seniors. They may be neighbors, they may be caretakers, and unfortunately they may be family members that take advantage of our senior citizens. But what you're gonna to hear today is, is, is how we protect our seniors. You're gonna hear information about how to avoid becoming a victim. And today, we also have with us our Senior Victim Services Agency. And just relatively recently, our Senior Victim Services Agency was going to actually go out of business um, because what was happening is it was a nonprofit independent agency and the Commission on Crime and Delinquency was cutting the funding. I had a meeting with the Commission on Crime and Delinquency and they had said to me that if you take over the Senior Victim Agency, we will continue to fund it. So of course, I agreed to take over Senior Victim Services. Now it is part of the District Attorney's Office. So we're happy today to present a presentation to you dealing with Senior Victim Services. Chelsea Price is here. She's going to do uh, um, the presentation. She has a couple of her employees with her here today. You're gonna to hear that today. Now, Senior Victim Services is a very important agency now in the District Attorney's Office. And it's not inside the courthouse. It's outside on, in, on Olive Street, uh, about a block away from the District Attorney's Office, where seniors can go and get services that are becoming a that have become a victim, or that may become a victim, get information, or just to talk uh, to some of the representatives of the district attorney's office to help them understand some of the issues. So it's really important to us to have that. Uh, so that's why now Senior Victim Services is no longer a nonprofit agency. Uh, it's under the umbrella of county government under uh, the district attorney's office. So you also hear from them today. We're also very lucky to have with us a number of our white collar crime detective and senior exploitation detectives and our chief uh, of our criminal investigation division. Our criminal investigation division handles all types of crime. But one of the many areas of our criminal investigation as mentioned is our white collar crime. And before becoming the head of our entire criminal investigation, Joe Ryan, who is now our currently a chief, he handled and was the supervisor of white collar crime. And he's a graduate of the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania, and understands finance, economics, and understands how to put these cases together, and understands the importance of protecting our seniors. And he will be one of the guest speakers here uh, today. So I'm very thankful I'm going to stay around during the course of this morning. We're going to open it up and answer any questions that you have. Any questions you have dealing also with any aspect of the office. I know today we're here for elder, cr uh, elder crime, and I want you to come back on the 13th of December because we're going to be dealing with computer crime because you may expect that when we're involved in all of these cases, whether they're white collar, senior exploitation, um, sexual crime cases, and unfortunately the many murders that we have here in Delaware County, we use um, computer forensic technology to help solve those crimes. And everybody that has a cell phone on them today, which I would guess is probably everybody in this room, has a computer uh, with them. And those cell phones now are computers, and these computers uh, give us invaluable information that we can use in the course of a prosecution of a case. So we invite you to come back on December 13th. We're going to be talking about cybercrime. We're going to be talking about cell phones. We're going to be giving demonstrations of how we can extract all the information from a cell phone and be able to use it in a criminal prosecution. So I thank you. I love being here at Newman University. I love being at the Miranda Center. It's a beautiful building, a beautiful day, and I hope you enjoy the morning. And now I'm going to turn the program over uh, to um, uh, my uh, chief, 
uh, Chief Joe Ryan, uh, who's been uh, a member of the District Attorney's Office for many, many years and has incredible experience and expertise. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, just getting over a cold, so I hope my voice holds out. And I hope I don't mess up. I'm not very good at technology, so hopefully yeah, we get through the... Uh, uh, look at that, see this? You put a new one on, it comes up uh, one thing at a time. Look at this. It's amazing. <laughs> All right, so let's get started. So, as Jack said, we've had the unit uh, doing the uh, fraud cases. I've been in the office, um, let me think, about... Um, 28, 29 years. Prior to that, I spent uh, 10 years with Lower Marion Township Police Department over in Montgomery County. Um, as Jack said, while I was at Lower Marion, I put myself through uh, uh, the Wharton School, got my degree from uh, Wharton, and left police work for a year in between. But uh, if you add all those numbers up, you'll realize that I started being a police officer when I was six years old, <laughs> youngest person ever hired in the state. Um, so when I first came in, uh, my the reason I got hired at the DA's office was because I was able to do the economic crime cases. They had no one at the time who was able to do, uh, who had any experience in the finance field or the accounting field to put these cases together. And as Jack said, over that period of time, we now have seven, seven detectives uh, doing uh, fraud work. We have a uh, program with Villanova University where we bring in a senior, uh, junior or senior accounting or finance major. We're on a six month co-op at a time to help us with the spreadsheets. And we also have a full-time uh, retired IRS agent who also uh, is working just doing the, uh, the spreadsheet. So the unit has really expanded. The, the problem has expanded not only with businesses and all, but probably the fastest growing area we're seeing is the frauds with, uh, with our seniors. So, you know, why is that? Why do we have such issues with, uh, with senior fraud? Well, some interesting background on this. In 1900, in 1900, only 4% of the population were over 65, about 3.1 million Americans. By 2009, it jumped up to almost 13%, or about 1 in 8 Americans. In 2014, it was about 1 in every 7. Expected to reach 21% by the year 2040. That's a lot of people. You know, people are just living longer. We're going to talk about that later, how, how this uh, increase in life expectancy has really played into uh, our seniors being victimized. Uh, in 1900, the average life expectancy was 47.3 years. In 2013, it's, it was 80.1. So if you look at that, basically, in a little over 100 years, we've expanded life expectancy by you know, somewhere around 30, 33 years. That's a pretty big number. Average life expectancy for a woman is now 86 years. Average life expectancy for men is 84 years. Does anybody know why uh, husbands die like two years sooner than their wives? Because they can't. No, no. Say that, really. Uh, really. It's only escape. It's only escape. Uh, Pennsylvania has the fifth highest concentration of people ages 65 and over. Um, and we're, our, our population of older people is growing rapidly. The Pennsylvania, right here where we sit in Delaware County, as one of the highest populations of seniors in many of the counties at 15.3%. And if you don't believe me about that, just that any morning around Baltimore Pike, and you can see the casino buses running up and down Baltimore Pike. Um, but anybody know why one of the reasons uh, Pennsylvania has a high concentration of seniors? It's a tax thing, right? There right, it's a tax issue. So you'll have a lot of seniors from the surrounding states when they retire, they'll actually retire to Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania does not uh, tax their pensions on the state level. So it's, a, you know, it's sort of a haven for a lot of seniors. So, why are seniors, so we have a little bit about the demographics, so why are the seniors targets? Well, if you look at our elder generation now, as I said, people are living longer than they ever have before. Um, first generation, basically, the people in their 80s and 90s now who are still healthy out there, Really, the first generation to benefit from Social Security over the long haul. They've had a lot of lives. Uh, first generation, maybe the last generation to benefit from high quality pension plans. Especially if you look at here in the Delaware County area, we had a lot of really good companies that these people retired from. You know, the post office, uh, Westinghouse, uh, the uh, shipyard. Uh, there was a lot of good Boeing that's still there. 
but there are a lot of good companies here in Delaware County that have really good pension plans that people retired and are having you know, great pension plans. And for the most part, the, the older generation, really the children of the Great Depression, they're a generation of savers. Uh, you know, I remember growing up, we had one credit card in the house, and uh, it was for uh, Sears. And the only time that credit card got used was if the washer broke, I mean, it wasn't go out and put stuff on the credit card. It's a whole different mindset now with the younger generation where you know, credit's a big issue. Um, uh, the, I'll, go, I'll go skip this one. The increase in home value. You know, you look at people who bought their houses in the, in the 60s and the 70s, and what has happened to those home values between the 60s and 70s and now. You look at people who might have bought houses back in, in, in those times, paid 10, 15, 20,000 for houses that are now worth, you know, well over $100,000, sometimes even up in the 200s, depending on what neighborhood uh, those, houses, those houses sit in. But the medical advances is a very, very uh, important part, I think, of the reason we're seeing a lot of the uh, problems and a lot of the fact that the seniors are being victimized. And that is, you know, we talked about the life expectancy, you know, up close to uh, 40 years. If you think about it, though, the medical advances have been on the physical side. You know, heart disease, they have pretty much under control. Cancer, they're making great inroads on. People don't die of a lot of these diseases at a younger age. They're living longer. However, 20 years ago, did you ever hear of dementia? Did you ever hear of Alzheimer's? Really, you really didn't hear about those things 20, 25 years ago. The advances medically on the mental side have not kept up with the physical side. So what that is creating is a whole population of our seniors who are still living out in the community who can get up every day, you know, they take care of their house, they, uh, you know, they can do the base, take their medicine, make their breakfast and all, but they're just not as sharp mentally as they used to be. So they're targets for a lot of these scams. Uh, you know, their memories are bad. I know even, you know, even at my age, I'm having a hard time sometimes with names. Um, it's never a problem unless you call your wife the wrong name, and that could be a problem. But, uh, other than that, uh, it's really not that big of an issue. So what are we seeing? What types of fraud are we seeing committed against the elderly? Well, identity theft, fiduciary theft, credit card, debit card fraud, home improvement, construction fraud, telemarketing, and now growing, growing quickly is the internet fraud. Uh, when I started giving this presentation, or a variation of it, like 20 years ago, that wasn't on my list. It's on my list now. It's on my list big time. All right, so what is identity theft? Well, identity theft's been around forever. It's sort of a term that, uh, you know, I was talking to Steve uh, ahead of time. He's been doing fraud as long as I have. Identity theft wasn't, a, wasn't really a term 20, 25 years ago, but it was happening. Things were happening. People were getting credit cards and using it. But now it has its own title called identity theft. So basically, it's anybody using anybody's information to create some type of account uh, to benefit themselves financially. First started, it used to be uh, basic credit cards. You're talking about people would open up credit cards. But now it's everything. It's loans, it's investment accounts, it's anything that they can do to steal people's information. Sadly to say, what we see overwhelmingly when we talk about our seniors is that the people who are committing these crimes, as Jack had mentioned earlier, excuse me, are usually relatives or close friends, and more so relatives than others. Because one of the scenarios we see, and again, this goes back to the demographics, it goes back to how I think that's so important that we're aware of how the demographics are changing, because, you know, this generation now, so we have seniors, grandma and grandpa, uh, or even sadly to say, a lot of times, grandma, because grandpops died, still living in the house, and they have this generation of children or grandchildren who are coming back home to mom and dad's house or grandma and grandpa's house, and usually they're coming back not for a good reason. Hey, there's, great, there's some you know, situations out there, people are moving back to take care of their parents. But a lot of times, the reason these, these adult children or grandchildren are coming back is because they have their own problems, whether it be drugs, alcohol, financial, um, you know, a divorce situation. So a lot of times these people that are coming back into the household aren't really, they may have five children, it may not be the best child to come back to the household. But what happens, what we're seeing is they come back uh, to the household because they have these problems and then what will happen is one of the 
parents will get sick. Now, you know, again, what we see in this older generation is, is a whole story about how it was in my house growing up. My mom stayed home, uh, raised the five of us. She did a pretty good job with four of them. Uh, and uh, you know, so, but she didn't work. My dad went out and worked, but he took care of the finances. He took care of paying the bills. Um, so that was sort of common, not so much common now, but back in that generation, that was very common. So what you see is, and what we're seeing is, what will happen is, so Johnny comes back, Johnny has his issues, he's living in the house, mom and dad are there, grandma and grandpa, and all of a sudden, dad gets sick, dad has a heart attack, dad has to go to the hospital. <coughs> it's, you know, here's, a, here's couples have been together for 25, 50, you know, years, and all of a sudden, there's just disruption in the family. So a lot of times what we'll see is they'll turn to the child that's living in the house to help them out, keep the house full. Uh, they'll give them power of return, they'll have them do the financial stuff. Probably the worst, they may have five kids, probably the worst kid to pick the bill. So a lot of times that's the scenario we're seeing where our seniors are, are being victimized by identity theft. And we're gonna talk about some other types of fraud, but it sort of all falls under this umbrella where we see it a lot of times with when it's a, it's a relative. But as far as the identity theft, there's actually on the internet, there's, there's, there's these dark web pages where people are actually stealing the uh, information and actually selling it on the internet, selling people's information to other groups or sometimes just giving it out. Uh, I always say, if you think about it, you know, basically all you really need to open some accounts is a person's name and date of birth. So where can you go out today in your car and you know drive around and get all the names and date of birth that you want without ever getting out of your car on a nice sunny day like today? Not far from here. You can walk. You can walk from here. Give me a clue. You can walk from here and get probably a list of names. What's that? Library. No, not the library. Walk right from here and get names and date of birth. It's easy as heck. Cemetery. Cemetery. Right. Tombstones. So if you get the names and date of birth and recent death, you have a good chance of getting, you may be able to take that information because nobody, if you think about it, nobody really reports when people die. So if someone's out opening information, they have this information. The other things we see are, you know, we have dumpster divers, people who run, run, run around around stealing people's trash and uh, taking information out of the trash. And if you don't, we're gonna talk about shredders in a second. If people aren't shredding all that information, it's, it's, it's really amazing the wealth of information that's out there. You know, you know I had to give the corporations uh, a lot of credit. Back when I started doing all this, it was information. You'd get your statement, your, sometimes your date of birth was on there, your full social security number. Companies have gotten wise, and a lot of times when you get it now, just maybe the last four of your social security may not be on there at all. So companies are, you know, trying to catch up with it, but we still have this problem, especially with the seniors. Um, and again, you know, seniors, a lot of times when their information is stolen, they're not aware. Because think about it, they're not really using their credit. They're not using their credit like you and I may be. You know, they're in their houses, they're established. You know, a lot of times seniors, they have their car for, you know, 10, 15 years, and I know uh, uh, my in-laws, when they buy a new one, they pay cash for it. They trade their old one, and they, they, don't, they don't use their credit. Um, so they're not aware. They're not really checking their credit reports like other people may be. So identity theft. Unauthorized use of existing credit checking accounts or creation of new accounts or loans using victims' identities. In 2014, 8% of persons 65 or older experienced identity theft victimization. A lot of people, and 8% of people over 65. Misuse of the existing credit card accounted for 64% of identity theft crimes in 2013. So although we have these other types of identity theft, loans, buying cars, buying houses, uh, we're still seeing, um, we're still seeing the, 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 the uh, bulk of it is in the, in the credit card uh, area. You know, we have, uh, one of the other things we do is insurance fraud, and just to, as far as identity theft, we've actually handled cases. We have one right now. We just we just made an arrest on it, where a person got another person's medical information. This isn't the first case like this we've had, and actually went and had a, a baby delivered on somebody else's information. So they actually you know so it's everywhere. I mean, identity theft to deliver a baby. Think about it. 
using someone else's insurance information. Yes. Joe, is this data Delaware County, these percentages? No, or is it national? Year, these here are national. That's national. These here are national. All right. So, one of the things we really like to get out to when we talk to the seniors is uh, to check their credit reports. <coughs> now, you know, they're making it easier now. Now, there's a federal law, I always say it's a couple years old, but now it's probably 10 years old at least, where, you know, before it was very hard to get your own credit report. Now, there's a federal law that you have to be able to get your credit report every, uh, was it every year now. So, what I suggest is there's three main credit reporting companies, Experian, TransUnion, Equifax. For the most part, the information is the same on all of them. But I always suggest if you can, contact one every four months and get, get one from a different company because each one has to give you one once a year. Um, has anybody here checked? Wait a minute, how many people have checked their credit in the last year? That's a good part. You go out to the senior groups and we, we give us talk to the senior groups, you know, it's not that many. But one of the things I always do with them is I sit down and when we talk about it, and I go over some things that, you know, I think they should be very, really, really uh, aware of uh, to make sure there's no, no uh, fraudulent accounts. Um, so, you know, what do I tell them to look for? Well, one of the first things is the top of your credit report is what we call the header. It will have basically your name, addresses, that type of information, social security numbers. I always say, you know, if your social security number is one digit off, if they have like, you know, and it's a seven and it's a nine, that's probably just an input error. I mean, somebody misread a seven for a nine. Uh, if it's significantly different, that's a red flag. The other thing I always say you really want to look for is different addresses. If on that header information, you know, they'll list, they'll list past addresses. And there's an address on that credit report you never lived at. That's a big red flag. Because, of course, once somebody gets your credit, what do they want to do? They don't want those credit cards going to your house. They want to go into their house. So they're going to try to change the address. So that, you know, on the, on the header, uh, that's really a uh, important thing to look at. Again, the social security numbers, if they're significantly different, I think that's important. If it's one or two digits off because you're, like I said, a seven or a nine, I won't get all that excited about it. Uh, next section on these is that it, they're, they're all set up a little differently, is on the open accounts. It's really important, and especially for our seniors, to really check the open accounts because it's not just good enough to go down there and say, oh yes, I have a Macy's card. Uh, I have a, uh, oh, I have a, uh, you know, a, a Visa card. You really want to check the account number associated with it. Because what some people will do when they steal identity is, and they, have, they can get the information that's on your credit report, or they're in your, uh, uh, you know, they steal your mail and they see where you have cards, a lot of times they'll open ones at the same businesses. So they may open a Macy's card, they may open a, uh, you know, a, uh, a Visa card, wherever. So it's very important to take time going through the open account section and, and look at what's open. Now, the other thing is, if there's a lot of accounts that are still listed as being open on there that you don't have anymore, it's not a bad idea to get, on, you know, get a hold of them and see if you can get them off. And there's two schools of thought on whether you should have these accounts taken off. I think you should if you have these old accounts. You know, so if you go home and you, you look at your credit report, you still have a, a Gimbal's card on your, uh, on your credit report, it's safe to say. Okay, now I really feel old, so you saw two people laugh. I mean, <laughs> one. I mean, if I said Lip Brothers, we never, uh, yeah, they probably still know about it, but anyway. Right? These two guys over here are looking at me like, what the hell is he talking about? Um, so, the, the recent inquiry section I feel is one of the most important areas to look at on your credit report. And this is why. When you go home today and you get your mail and you have these pre-approved offers for this company and that company, what happens is uh, they're the pre-approved. We're going to talk about them in a second. That's not what I'm talking about. What you want to do is in that recent inquiry section is anybody who's looked at your credit, it pops up there. So, if you look at that section and you see that Macy's checked your credit last month and you didn't apply for a Macy's card or GMC, you know, credit, checked your credit, it may be legitimate. It could be checking your credit to make an offer, but it's a good red flag. There's something on there in, that, you know, in, the, in the verification section that you didn't know on these recent inquiries 
you want to get on the phone and contact that company and say, why are you checking my credit? Because it could be a red flag that somebody's trying to get credit in your name. Now the last section of most of them is what we call the pre-approved. That's why I go back to saying you go home, you get all those offers in the mail. You don't have to worry about them too much because what happens uh, if they're on your credit report, um, these companies buy information. They buy, for lack of a better term, they buy group credit scores. You fall into a certain, that's how they make you those offers because you meet their requirements. So they're the ones where they're sending you at home and you get all this stuff in the mail every day. So that's sort of a brief overview of, the, uh, of uh, looking at a credit report and, and, and things, to, things to look for. Shredders, shred everything. Address labels, utility bills, financial statements, these pre-approved credit card applications, old checks, anything with identification information. Again, this is something that's you know, going by the wayside, old checks, nobody gets their checks back anymore. But, they still get copies of them in, the, uh, in their financial, you know, in their monthly, most people, if they're still getting their statements in the mail, are still getting at least a, a face sheet with maybe 10 checks on them. Uh, you know, uh, we don't give, uh, most banks, I don't know anybody actually who still gets their old checks returned to them at the end of the month. These guys are again looking at me saying, like but, but you know, it's for the seniors, they know what I'm talking about and they do, but the thing with the seniors too is they keep stuff, you know, they're hoarders. So, they probably still have in their house checks from 10 years ago that they really need to shred. Um, and one of the things that we see, too, is along this line, which affects our seniors, is when there's a death in the family. So, you know, say mom and dad are still living in the house, dad dies, mom's going to go live with a child or something. The family comes in, they want to clean the house out. A lot of times they tend to do is just throw all the stuff out in the trash. So it's really important for the families to realize that you got to shred all that stuff. Especially, you know, they'll, they'll keep their financial statements, maybe their Vanguard account statements, their uh, Fidelity account statements have been there. It's got a ton of information on it. So it's really, really important that even families who are helping with seniors, you know, shred everything. Everybody should. I always say it's a great, it's a great Christmas gift to have those people in the house, you know, especially your seniors. You should never think what to buy them. Buy them a shredder. Uh, it's a really useful thing. And spend the extra 10 bucks and get the crust cut shredder. Don't just get the strip shredder. Uh, makes uh, makes like confetti out of it. Very very hard to put that stuff back together. Um, anything at all with the, you know identification on it should be shredded. Old credit cards. They done them. Most of the shredders will shred them for you. They're they're, they're strong enough to shred credit cards. So you should really you know do that. Not like for time. Yeah. Okay, fiduciary misappropriation. Uh, what is that? Well, basically, it's anybody that has legitimate access. To your money, who can uh, do things with it? What do we say again? We're back to the close friends and relatives uh, who have this legitimate access, but are using the withdrawals for personal benefits, uh, known to the victim. Where do we see it a lot? Well, we see it a lot with power of attorney. That's our biggest single problem with uh, misappropriations: power of attorney. We have had some cases with insurance agents. Uh, I'll go back to the uh, uh, power of attorneys a minute, but insurance agents. Um, what we've seen with them is situations where seniors have life insurance policies and they're in a box. You know that metal box on their mom and dad's bed that's been there for 50 years? You go in there as insurance. So again, you know, a lot of this stuff, I hate to say it, a lot of this stuff is generated by the death of one of the spouses. A lot of times when we see this, there's some death involved that sort of generated this. <coughs> So what we may see, and what we have seen in the past with insurance agents, is one of the spouses die, family knows there's an insurance policy, and they have generated, they go, to, they go to find this insurance policy, and they find it, you know, it's got not much dust on it, uh, the box under the bed, and they get it out, they find it, and they'll find when they go to cash it in that sometimes there's another insurance policy. People never do you know anything about? Or the cash value has been taken out of this insurance policy. And uh, what we're seeing is where what will happen is some unscrupulous insurance agents, what they'll do is with these policies, they'll use the cash up, the uh, build up cash value to go and buy more policies for this person. And you say, well, that's a good thing, they're buying their policies. Well, it is, and the people didn't make the decision. So you say, well, why, why would they do that? So why would they do that? 
why would an insurance agent go and use a build up cash value to buy more insurance for a person? Commission. Commission. Yeah. commission, right. They're generating commissions for themselves. So we've had cases like that. So it's really, you know, if you have parents, grandparents, whatever, good question. You know, it's a good time to sit down and talk to them about their insurance bonds because a lot of people have them. You know, uh, back then, especially in the 60s and 70s, a lot of people were buying whole life policies that are worth a lot of money now. A lot of people now buy term, which is just insurance. But back then, there was a lot of, you know, whole life was a big product. And their whole life policies built, uh, you know, point in the 60s or 70s probably have a lot of double cash value and are worth a lot of money now. So it's a good issue to uh, sit down and talk to seniors about. Financial advisors, uh, we used to have a real big problem with this, not as much anymore, but it's churning. And it's the same, it's the same situation where, you know, you have seniors who really may not have a lot of financial background, financial uh, understanding, especially again if dad had taken care of all the finances all his life, he dies, mom sort of left her own, she trusts, you know, very, very trusting generation, the, uh, the older ones, you know, the person was a professional, seniors have a lot of trust in those people, whether it be their doctor, their insurance agent, their financial advisor, they just have this, it's a very trusting, trusting generation. Uh, so charity was basically the same situation where financial advisors would buy and sell stocks uh, on a person's account for no legitimate reason other than to generate commissions for themselves. Um, don't say it as much, but a lot of crackdown federally and from the regulatory agencies on advisors by the cities. It's still out there. It's still out there. So back to power of attorney. Again, that's our biggest single area where we're seeing our seniors being victimized by close friends or, or you know, family members. Um, again, it gets back to the situation I talked about earlier. We have children and grandchildren coming back home uh, to take care of uh, family members, mom, dad, whatever. And the, you know, the typical scenario is they're there, they have a drug problem, they have an alcohol problem, they have a gambling problem, you know, through a messy divorce, uh, they basically have financial problems. They're with mom and dad, one of them gets sick, they get a problem in the household, maybe it's again dad, mom doesn't uh, really take care of the finances, so instead of this isn't going to time to think about who should we make power of attorney, so what they do is, oh, well, Johnny's here, Mary's here, they're here all the time, let's make them power of attorney. They turn around and make this person power of attorney and figure, and that's my son, my daughter, you know, they know, they know in the back of their head, they know this person has a gambling problem, they know they have a drug problem, but, you know, at the time, their, their, their world's upside down because the spouse is sick in the hospital uh, and they turn. And we, I can't tell you how many cases we've seen where the accounts just start getting drained because they have the power of attorney. I had a case years ago where a, uh, a, a woman had her grandson, uh, power, he came to live with her, he had some issues, uh, gave him power of attorney. He moved her five different nursing homes a little over a year. Uh, because he wasn't paying the bills, and when they put her pressure, he would just transfer her. At the same time, he took all her money <clears throat> and bought, her ha bought a house down in Ocean City, New Jersey. Of course, he bought it in her name, so his power of attorney. But uh, he was going to Ocean City every weekend while she was uh, being shuttled from nursing home to nursing home. Uh, so, you know, it's out there. It's, it's, it's a big problem. Um, Jen, are, yes? Are these power of attorneys, that you're, the documents, are they... Um, do it yourself power of attorneys or are they? No, a lot of times they're, they're done by an attorney. Um, you can technically do it by yourself, by right. attorneys. And you know, I know that um, when Jack, Jack used to do, uh, you know, before he became DA, he had his own practice. We've talked about this numerous times. He would uh, make the people come in with the person, sit down, talk to them, and explain quite clearly to them, you know, what this works. And then he would have the person who's you know, the elderly person stay, ask the other person to leave, and really go over a series of questions, and making sure they really knew. Now, they did change the law probably about 10, 15 years ago. Um, gave a little bit of teeth, but it doesn't really have as much teeth as I think it should have. But basically, what the power of attorney is, you know, it's not giving someone the power to use that person's money for themselves, it's giving them the power to use that money for that other person's benefit. Um, so they have to keep records. Uh, they have to uh, keep accounting. Do they do it? No, they don't. Uh, but what the, when the law changed, they make the person giving the power of attorney sign a form basically explaining, you know, what, what power you're giving up here? What power you're giving to this person? 
and they make the person who is uh, becoming the power of attorney sign a similar form saying this is your responsibility, it's what you need to do. So has, has it worked? Yeah. Uh, we're still seeing the cases, so I don't know how, how much it worked. And one of the other issues we see too uh, with these fiduciary situations is you, know, you have the neighbor um, of a senior and maybe they're doing the shopping, shopping for the senior or something and the senior gives them their debit card and says, you know, pay for this. And hey, look at that. Can you give me a hundred dollars out so I have some you know money for this week? And you know, we've seen cases where yeah, the neighbor's doing that, but they're also taking a hundred out for themselves. Um, you know, I, I always joke because I go back when I was uh, uh, young, I used to work at a grocery store and uh, they were doing deliveries and all. There was an old lady who lived down the street from us, and uh, every day we delivered, she would order our stuff every day, but then she would always forget, so she would call up the store and because I lived on the street, said, oh, when, when Joe gets done work, can he drop off uh, this? And there was no, and she, every time you went to her house, she gave you a dollar. It's the time pretty good. Uh, there was no truth to the rumors, though, that I used to purposely forget to deliver stuff to her just to get her a dollar. Like, that's not true. But we do have, you know, situations where we're having this. And now people are giving debit cards, they're giving their PIN numbers, and uh, we're seeing where they're taking out extra money. And again, you know, a lot of times the seniors aren't checking their accounts every month, which we really strongly urge them to do when we give the talk, is to go over that account every month. But some just don't, they just don't really look at them. So they don't really notice that the money's missing until it gets to a point where it's significant out of their accounts. All right, the credit card, you know, we say now credit card, debit cards, basically it's the same card. You know, you, you walk, they ask you, you want to use credit, you want to use debit. You know, basically the difference is with the credit card versus the debit card, the debit card's, you know, tied into an account. So if you have a tie into your checking account, you use debit, it comes automatically out. A credit card, you get the monthly statement, you decide what to, uh, what to pay on. Um, one of the things we talk about a lot with our seniors is not to give their, their cards up, uh, especially in restaurants. You know, there's an issue out there. Uh, with, with skimmers. I think I have on my next slide going to be a picture of a, uh, of a skimmer. But basically, basically what you'll see every now and then, I know Steve works with the Secret Service a lot, and the Secret Service is a lot of these jobs, where, especially like upscale restaurants, you know, if you, those, that's where we're going to the chip cards. I don't know why we're so far behind. Yours had the chip cards for years. But, you know, that little brown strip or black strip on the back of your card, that's all your information. That's how when they Swipe your credit card, that's how they know to put it on your bill at the end of the month. It has all your information on it. So what, what we're seeing for a lot of uh, problems was in, in stores, in uh, gas stations, uh, in restaurants, people who give their credit card um, would go, walk away with it, and in their pocket they'd have this little skimmer. They could just swipe the card right through their skimmer when they went to, to, to uh, actually do the transaction. <coughs> So I'm a big fan, and a lot of restaurants now have the handheld machines. They'll come to your table and, uh, and do it. So I always tell seniors, you know, make sure you know what you're doing. Now, big issue now is the self-serve gas stations. Uh, a lot of that's coming, uh, a lot of this is the, uh, coming out of Russia, these groups, and they're putting these skimmers right in the uh, ATM <coughs> machines, they're putting them right into the gas station pumps, they're reading your cards as they're going out. They're putting, I mean, it's amazing how sophisticated some of this stuff is. We're putting cameras up, trying to grab uh, your PIN number in an ATM machine. They're putting the reader right in uh, into the machine, and here we are. Here's some of the, uh, the uh, you know the pictures. Here's how small it can be. As you see, it fits in the palm of your hand. It's just the slides. Put it right in there and download the information right off the card. One of the things we tell people is when you go to these machines, these things fit right over. See, it looks exactly like what it's going over. Um, we tell them try to take it off. And before you put your card in, you know, take a take a sw swipe at the thing, see if it moves, uh, whatever. I mean, the uh, gas stations, it's amazing. Uh, uh, a lot of these groups, they'll pull up in trucks that look like they're some type of repair truck. They'll pull, park right in front of the pump, take it out, they're working on the pump, and you know, <coughs> uh, especially at the convenience stores where it's not really a gas station, the guys that are really watching it. Um, and they put, these, they put these readers right on the uh, gas pumps 
like you know, it's like uh, hiding in plain sight. They, they're just not real sneaky. They walk up and act like they're working on the uh, the pump. People inside say, no, I guess they're I guess they're servicing the pumps and never say anything. Now the companies are doing much better training now that this is out there. Or you know, if you see somebody at the, at the pumps, make sure you uh, call someone. Home improvement and construction. Again, it goes back, and I keep referring back to our demographic issues. Like that's how a lot of this is being able to be uh, uh, victimized. Our seniors, uh, basically, the home improvement contractors targeting the seniors, especially those living alone, getting their purchases repaired, their driveways, termites. Years ago, when I first started doing fraud, it was basically just the gypsies. Every time, every spring, as soon as the daisies popped up, the gypsies were out. You know, they were either trying to knock at people's doors, go look at their roof and say they needed their driveway, spraying black hole liquid on their driveways. It's gotten a lot worse than that now. It's, you know, basically, you know, if you think about it, other than the new law where people are supposed to be registered, there's really no requirements to be a home improvement contractor. You know, until they, I always use the joke until they pass the law where you have now, and they will have to register. But you had to have a license in Pennsylvania to cut someone's hair before the law. But you didn't have to have a license to put a you know half a million dollar addition on somebody's house and you have to be able to prove whether you could do it or not. I mean, technically tomorrow I go out, throw some magnetic signs on my pickup truck saying I'm Joe the handyman and go around and, and, and do stuff. So a lot of times with our seniors, you know, they'll get these knocks on the door, you know, claiming that these people are doing evaluations in the area or work nearby and notice that they had a problem. Uh, convince the senior they can repair the problem while they're in the area. Two issues with the home improvement and contractor fraud. One is, a lot of times it's the fraud of the contractor. The other issue we see is the distraction burglaries, where these people will come to the door and say, hey, look, you know, we were doing work in the area, and we noticed that uh, your roof looks like we're working across the street, and we look there, we, your roof needs repair. Uh, come on out here, let me show you. And they'll get the senior to come outside, like they're showing them, and somebody else will either go in the back door or burglarize the house. That's the one issue. The other issue is with actually convincing them to give them money for either non-needed non work or for work that they're not really doing some type of poor quality. Um, what, we, uh, what we tell you know, our seniors is when we come to home improvement and construction fraud with contractors, one of the issues we... Um, run into is the fact that there's this balancing act between these home improvement scams as to whether or not, you know, the gypsies, they're easy, they're, they're spraying black water, they're, uh, you know, not really doing any work, they're up there with a bucket of water pouring it off, and there's, there's uh, things, they're out now for us. It becomes more difficult on the home improvement side when you have, you know, Joe the handyman who wants to be a contractor and, and uh, people hire him to do work. The problem you run into where we have this balancing act between whether it's civil or criminal is basically is the work started. Once the work is started, it becomes very, very difficult. Uh, and this doesn't really just go for seniors, it's for anyone, but our seniors are victimized a lot by this. It becomes very, very difficult for us to prosecute unless we can show some overriding scheme. So basically, and, and, and the theory is, you know, it's what you bargain for. Hey, I may think, you know, Joe the handyman is the best window installer in the world. And I'm willing to pay him a thousand dollars a window because nobody puts windows in like Joe the handyman. Maybe Bobby would do it for two hundred dollars a window. So they give a deposit and they start to work. You know, they, they, they work, but when you get done, the work's really, you know, shoddy and you know, we, we had a case uh, a few years ago where actually contract really felt bad for the family to come in. They were just bad. They poured the foundation. They know what they were doing. They poured the foundation. Within six months, this addition actually separated from the house. Um, nothing we could do. It was a civil problem. It was just shoddy, shoddy workmanship. Um, sometimes we've been lucky. Uh, even after they started to work, we did a case a few years ago with a uh, kitchen guy who went around and uh, you know basically legitimate contractors. You take a third at the signing of the contract. A third of the start of work and a third is finished, <coughs> uh, with some variations. That's basically how legitimate contractors work. Um, what this guy was doing was he was doing kitchens. He'd go around, he underbid everybody, he'd get the contracts on the contract. People gave him a third. 
He would come in and gut your kitchen. Put a dumpster in the driveway, gut the kitchen. Now we got a second third. Never see the guy again. In that case, it was a pattern. We were able to show a repeated pattern. This guy did this to about five victims. We prosecuted him because it wasn't a case of a dispute over the way. This guy just had a scam going. But again, uh, you know, it's tough. We tell our seniors to make sure you have a signed contract and make sure it's very detailed as to what's going to happen. And we also tell them that on the check, if the guy comes to you and says, hey, I need $2,000 deposit because we're going to put these windows in, I have to go buy the windows. We tell them in the memo section, write deposit for windows. Because if he doesn't show up, it really helps us. And we've done this numerous times where we'll go to the window. Where, where is he buying? Where did he tell you he's buying the windows? Oh, uh, the Home Depot down in Clifton Heights. We go down to Home Depot and they say, hey, is Johnny the, uh, is Joey the contractor here? So does he have an account here? Is he buying it for Mrs. Smith? Did he order these windows? No, we don't know who you're talking about. We'll charge him, even though, you know, so the more, the more we tell, you know, the more we, information we can get, the more specific information on contracts, um, the better off we are. You know, one of the things we do with this talk, too, is when we go out and we give it to our seniors, is the fact that, I always say, we've been doing this so long, we go, to, we go to like the senior centers, we go to like the church uh, senior groups, we, we do this. And I always tell them, you know, I love talking to you, but you're really not the people we need to be talking to. You know, so we always tell them, whatever you hear today, please, please go back, because we all know those seniors that are homebound, whether it's because of uh, physical conditions or just because they don't want to come out. They're the ones that are much more vulnerable to being victimized. You know, the people that come to our talks and all, they're active, they, they're, they, they're, they're, they're in touch with things. Um, so some of the considerations we have with seniors, especially when they're victimized by contractors, you know, where do they live? Where are the contractors from? To make a prosecution, you know, what, what is our victim's physical and mental condition? Can they, can they get to court? Are they, you know, again, like I said earlier, you know, the, the physical, uh, medical advances are great. The mental ones aren't so. So you get someone on the stand who's already confused because, you know, Alzheimer's or dementia. And, uh, you know, if you're all familiar with uh, what we call sundowning, you know, we want to get to our seniors early in the, in the day. Uh, if you come to talk to me in the afternoon in my office, I may be asleep. That's not true, but uh, uh, some people may think so, especially the guys that work for me. But anyway. Um, the, the issue is, you know, there's all these physical and mental issues when you have seniors who are victims as far as getting them uh, through. But one of the other issues is, and this is something everybody has to really be aware of when they're dealing with seniors, is the last three things I have here. The fear, the embarrassment, and the independence. So when our seniors are victimized, especially by scams, especially by contracts, there's a real fear, a lot of times, for them to tell people about. What do you think the fear is? You think the fear is that these people are going to come back and get them? The people who, who victimize them, they're home alone, they're going to come back and get them? You think that's what the fear is? That's not what the fear is. The secure family will find out and they'll be put away somewhere. That's the fear. <laughs> the fear is they're embarrassed, they ever let themselves get in, they know better. And fear is that if they tell their family that all of a sudden their family's going to say, mom or dad, are they're losing it. We've got to go in it. You know, what's the one thing nobody wants to lose? Their independence. And our seniors, you know, this is, this is their independence. They're living alone. They love it. Uh, but they have this real fear. It's really, really shocking. When I first started building senior fraud, it was, it was an eye-opener to me that we had victims that wouldn't report uh, because of this, this issue of being fearful that, you know, mom or dad can't handle themselves anymore, maybe it's time for the nursing home, maybe it's time for us to take over their apartments. <coughs> so it's really a big consideration that we have to worry about when we're dealing with seniors, whether or not they're, they're being honest with us, um, you know, all the time. Um, one, of the, you know, one of the other issues is, and I uh, had a woman one time who was doing lottery scam. She uh, got the phone call that she had won the lottery, and uh, not like the prize patrol, and uh, they were coming to her house. And, but she had to send money, and she sent $5,000, because they were going to bring the big prize. And 
I went over and talked to her. She had the outside media and I went over and talked to her. I saw the, you know, we got the referral, got all the information, I explained to her that you know, there's, no, there's no prize patrol coming. Uh, about six months later, she did it again. She did it again. Um, so I went back over and I talked to her and I say that, you know, she did this, did this six months ago. You know, you lost 5,000, but you just lost another. Why do you talk to these people? You know, why do you, why do you talk to these people? Why do you just hang up? And she said to me, she said, you know, I'm here alone. It's, it's just nice to talk to somebody. When these people call, I talk to them, and they're so nice to me. You know, it's just nice. I'm going to show a video uh, at the end here, a short video about, uh, uh, right, right on point with that. Uh, you know, some of the other issues we have with uh, the uh, prosecution issues is that it is a global problem. Sometimes with some of the, uh, the uh, identity theft scams, suspects are difficult. Uh, they're organized groups, they're counterfeiting documents. As much as we see that, it's not our biggest problem. Our biggest problem with senior fraud is friends and neighbors, friends and relatives and neighbors. Yeah, do we see this stuff? Yeah. But it's really not, it's more grassroots stuff, it's more homegrown uh, victimization. You know, can the suspects be identify? Um, again, we talk about the written agreement for work. What exact work was agreed to? Uh, you know, where is the check cashed? A lot of times, you know, that's how we uh, track people. We find out where the check was cashed, check cash or whatever. You may have a picture. We track it down that way on the uh, on the back of the check. So a lot of times, we have our seniors uh, victimized. One of the first things we try to do is, and you're going to hear from Chelsea, we try to get senior victims involved in helping us, helping us help the seniors get the documents that we need to prosecute these cases, because sometimes they don't really understand why we need things. Uh, telemarketing fraud, 2013 study indicates over 40 billion per year is lost to telemarketing fraud. That's overall, not just seniors. Studies report that 50% of telemarketing fraud complaints were from people 50 years of age and older. This age group makes up only 33% of the population. So we have 57% of our people, of our uh, residents over 50. Again, these are national statistics. Um, but it's only 33% of the population. Again, as I just touched on, why seniors are more likely to be at home to receive calls. They're, they're, not, they're not working. Especially, again, this goes back to why when we give the talk, I, I try to hammer home, you need to go out and talk to the people from your church, from your social group, from your neighbors who are homebound. Because these are the people who are going to be victimized because they're likely to be home. Um, they're not easily, you know, it's, again, it's a trusting generation. They're not easily recognizing the frauds and phone pitches. And they're just too polite to hang up. Yes? Yeah. Just a quick question. Um, especially the these incident you, you raised just a few minutes ago about the woman who put 5,000 out and put another 5,000 out. Um, when you guys get become um, aware of these circumstances and you get an opportunity to talk uh, to these seniors. Is there any other direction or advice that you can send them, where you can send them to help them? Well, what we do is senior victim services, and uh, a lot of times uh, what we do is we go in, and we, a lot of times that's why we want to go out and talk to them at their house, because we try to sum up with any other social services. Like, we have a very good relationship with COSA, which mm -hmm. is the County Office of Services for the Aging. So it's not one thing common for us if we saw that there's some other issues that may be, you know, feeding into this, we'll do these referrals. But isn't, isn't COSA, though, more a socioeconomic circumstance? In other words, they have to qualify in order to get no, 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 no. no. Okay. You should be, I think it's across the board, even like with juveniles and if you're dealing with CYS, it, it doesn't matter, you're, you know, it's, it's more lo in, what do you call it, global than I mean, some of their some of their services may be. By that. Okay, some of their services yeah. may be based, some. but they'll go out and do an assessment. And uh, again, through uh, you know, now that we have senior victim services, they'll do it also. They'll be go out and talk to these people and try to see. A lot of times, they'll do our they'll do the bridge between COSET and them. I mean, it's just since we started this with having them in the office, it's just been phenomenal. How much more of an outreach we can do, and how much more of a follow-up we can do with the seniors. Um, I am um, just something I found really interesting a few years ago. I read a summary of a, st a study, but I that's all I did was read a summary of a study that talked about the deterioration of the brain as we age, and the part that is able to recognize like a fraudulent pitch 
that's part of the brain that deteriorates. Um, I, I'm not going to say like early, but earlier than maybe other parts that like the self-care and able to manage oneself in one's home. That part of the brain deter is deteriorating earlier than those other parts. So there could be seniors that are very well able to take care of themselves, but unable to tell when someone's being insincere as they pretend to be sincere. And it's really I, interesting. I wish I read the whole. Well, I, I, you know, I mean, it comes right down to it. Let's, well, what really drives a lot of this, no matter what your age is? Greed. That you think you won the lottery. Uh, you know, so everybody has this, like, greed in them. They think they're getting a better deal. Well, and with the elderly, like, with the lottery thing, it's like, well, I want to leave something for my family and my grandkids right. and my kids. Yes. Yeah, uh, that's true. You know, there's another, and uh, Chelsea and I were just talking about this the other day. I read it, I read it, maybe Steve, maybe Steve, you're aware of this. I read a study years ago, and I don't know what I ever did with it, but there was a study done showing that seniors who are victim of victimization of fraud have a, uh, you know, a uh, higher, I was say a higher death rate, but a, a quicker death rate than non-victims. And the study was based on the fact that, you know, you or I, we're working, we lose, we, you know, we're victimized, we become a, a victim of fraud or something. We're still working, we make the money back. But when you have a senior citizen who loses a substantial amount of money, and they're victimized, they don't have any way of getting their money back. You know, And that's their, their uh, tax money, that's their medicine money, that's their food money. So the, the, the death uh, rate, whatever you want to say, is higher among victims. And I'd love to get my hands back on that study, uh, but I haven't been able to find it. But I think it's important. You know, it makes sense if you think about the stress and depression that this causes when all of a sudden you know, they're, they're going to worry about how they're going to pay uh, the real estate taxes, how they're going to pay for their medicine next month. Uh, these issues are. But you know, it's just it's such a polite generation that just people like to, uh, to hang up. Um, I always tell them, I gotta give them what I do is you, know, you get these survey calls and, all, and you answer the phone and they want to, you know, you want a vacation or something. So what I always do is I say, all right, uh, and wait, wait one second, I just put the phone down on the counter and walk away. I just leave the phone on, you know, and then kids will walk by and say, why is the phone on the counter? I say, ah, it's a sales call. I said, pick up and see if you're still on there. And, uh, you know, you just don't talk to them. I mean, if they do that a while, they won't call back anymore. Okay, so primarily target senior citizens, literally one third of the victims of telemarketing fraud are over 60. Top five telemarketing schemes we see, we talked about the prizes, the sweepstakes, credit card offers, scholarships, advanced fee loans, and magazine sales. 67% of initial contact regarding schemes, these schemes involve the telephone. Um, you know, it's devastating to seniors more than other groups. I just talked about this. The financial losses are devastating to those with fixed incomes. They lose their self-esteem and question their ability to care for themselves. Again, embarrassment, for instance, from telling their stories, fear their families or view their victimization as a sign of diminishing, diminishing mental capacity. And again, they blame themselves for participating. I mean, I always tell the seniors, you know, especially when they get involved in these lottery schemes, you know, we see people of all ages get involved in these schemes. In these schemes. It's not just our seniors. It's just that it's much more, uh, they're home, they're taking the calls, so they're, they are a bigger group that's being affected by it. Uh, the grandparent scam. Everybody familiar with this? It's been around, it's sort of new. Relatively new, I should say. Um, you know, receive a call that your loved one is in trouble and needs money quickly. Anybody not hear of this? Just curious if it's good. Not here. Okay. Um, so basically, what will happen is they'll get, they'll get seniors' numbers, they'll call, and uh, all of a sudden, as soon as they pick up the phone and say hello, they'll say, uh, Oh, is that you, Grandma? And, uh, you know, grandparents being polite, Oh, Johnny, is that you? Yeah, now they got the name. Oh, yeah, 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 Grandma, it's Johnny. Hey, look, I was in an accident, and you know, I'm down the shore. I'm not supposed to be down the shore. I took Mom and Dad's car in an accident, and, uh, and I, if I don't have $500, I'm, I'm, they're going to lock me up, and I need, can, can you wire me $500? But please don't tell Mom or Dad. And unfortunately, their grandparents said don't, you know. Uh, and it's going, you know, and it's, a lot of money's going overseas, these scams. That's basically, but there's so many different variations of it now. The IRS scams. Anybody heard of the IRS scam? It's the same thing. You know, you get it's the, it's the same scam. It's just a different a different slant on it. You know. Um, you know they're doing it online also. We're going to talk about phishing in a minute on a, on an interesting thing with uh, with uh, what we call phishing online. Um, 
you know, once the money is wired, it's difficult to track. What people don't realize is they'll, they'll tell you maybe they'll tell you to wire to somewhere, but then you have to call them back or they'll call you back and they want the, the PIN number for lack of a better number. So that's all they need. Yeah, you may think you're wiring it to Colorado, but that person could be literally around the corner if they get the PIN number, they can go pick the money up or overseas or wherever. So, you know, that's that's the issue with that. Um, we always tell the seniors when we try to drive home, if you receive these calls, ask the person a question that they would only know. But again, you know, I, we give these talks, we give it to the people that are active, they're, the people that are getting victimized, and the people that aren't, to the people that are homebound. You know, how we get the message out to them sometimes, I'm always worried about and frustrated by. Uh, but you know, this is, this, this is the quick answer to this problem, is ask them a question that only they would know. You know what, Oh, okay, Johnny. You know, what's your mom's what's your mom's maiden name or something? You know, I mean, something simple. But again, you know, grandparents get these calls, and this person's all frantic on the phone. And uh, you know, unfortunately, they always they don't they don't say who is this. They say, Oh, Johnny, is that you? And now then they have a name, and they can run with their uh, they run with their scam. Uh, internet fraud. 2009 reported losses for for a doubled, uh, stemming from uh, to 500 and. $59 million, stemming from 336,655 complaints. Um, top five internet scams, fake checks, non-delivery of general merchandise, non-delivery auctions, Nigerian money offers, and lotteries. Imagine that, lotteries. 75% of internet frauds originate from websites. 25% of internet frauds originate from email. Um, this thing called phishing. Do we have a slide on phishing? My next one? Uh, fishing, here we go. Has anybody ever been a victim of phishing? So basically how this works is you'll get an email. Um, and I'll tell you a personal experience about it. One day I opened my email and um, it was, uh, what bank was it now? Who, who, who was the bank that had the big ID theft program a couple of years ago? Uh, Capital Capital Award. Wells Fargo? No. Um, Target? City was one of the first. Uh, huh? City was one of the first. City Bank. No, ones. City Bank. That's who it was, City Bank. Uh, so I get this email, <coughs> but it's like uh, the letter, and you open up the attachment, you know, it's this email letter saying, Dear Mr. Ryan, you know, uh, we had some problems with our computers, and uh, it's from City Bank, all official looking, their, their logo, their heading, and it said, you know, we need you to. Uh, uh, connect to this link and uh, verify all your account information. Well, fortunately, I was awake that day and realized I have no accounts at City <laughs> I never, never dealt with City Bank in my life. But they send, you know, mailings in these out. They buy these mailing lists. They get the information from people. They send this out. Hey, if they get 10 people to bite, to click on this link, fill in all this information about their account, they now have, they clean that account out in a matter of minutes. So that's how phishing works. Just say, so send us like all fishing. They throw it all out and see what bites. Uh, so, you know, make sure when you look at these emails, you get that you know who you're dealing with. Um, and we always tell our seniors, especially around Christmas time, and tell everybody around Christmas time, you know, be very, very careful. Everybody wants to do online shopping now. It's great, it's convenient. But make sure you know what you're dealing with, what website. You, know? you go to unknown websites companies you're not familiar with, you're really, you're really taking some risk there because you don't know what, what security they have or their, or, or their information. Could be, I'm going to say, not necessarily to be a, a fake company, could just be a company with poor security as far as taking uh, credit cards. We had a situation right at the courthouse about two years ago. The cafeteria started taking credit cards. So yeah, it was great. You got your lunch and everything. Uh, within about uh, two months, couldn't tell you how many people uh, in the courthouse got uh, their credit card scanned because the co third party company that they were using to process the transactions did not have the proper security features and they were being hacked into and get everybody's credit card information. Right at the courthouse, right at the, uh, the cafeteria. So it's really, you really take a risk when you go to unknown companies online. Not the fact that, again, you know, it could be a fake company to begin with, but it could be a legitimate company that just doesn't have the proper security for your uh, credit cards. Um, so, basically, you know, fraud against seniors on the rise. 
Our seniors are targets due to their problems associated with aging. Uh, again, you know, it's a wealthy generation. We talked about those issues. They're a generation of savers. Uh, you know, Social Security, good pensions, their housing, they sold, they sold their house and they have this money. I mean, it's not uncommon we see these cases. Uh, I, I always say my, when my grandmother died many years ago, she had an estate of like $5,000. Right? We see estates now from common working people in the millions. I mean, we're not talking about people who, you know, were millionaires. We're talking about people that worked good jobs, raised families, but just were savers. And they have, you know, a couple million dollars in their estates. It's not uncommon now to see that. Again, it's devastating to seniors. Now, last, before I end, I just want to show a quick video just to uh, you know, sort of drive the point home about the uh, scams. Okay. have directions here. <laughs> As you can see, this is why I need the middle of the co-op, because I'm not technological. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Oh, okay. Everybody hear that? Everybody's still awake. Okay. All right, so I guess at this point, Chelsea? Oh, break, break. There we go. That's what everybody wanted to hear. Break. <laughs> break. Hey, everybody's laughing now. Right, right. Best part of the day, the break. Yeah. All quick, right. Yeah, quick tip. Thank you so much, too, Brian. I appreciate it very much. Our next speaker, uh, everyone, if you're, if you're ready to resume, our next speaker, Chelsea Price, is the Director of Senior Victim Services for Delaware County earning her master's degree in public health with a concentration in community health from Westchester. Ms. Price joined the Delaware County DA's office as director. Ensuring victims of crimes over the age of 55 are informed of their rights and obtain services necessary to recover from victimization. <coughs> and please welcome folks, uh, Ms. Price, to discuss the solutions for the Following Chief Ryan is a difficult act to follow, uh, but today I'm just here to expand on some of the things that he already spoke to you about, uh, such as financial crimes, and I also want to give you an overview of what our unit within the District Attorney's Office does, introduce you to some of the individuals that uh, I work alongside with every day, and also give you some real-life examples of what we see come through our office every day as well. 
Okay, so just to give you an overview, as you've heard, uh, we know that our seniors are vulnerable for a number of reasons. Uh, when we're talking about telephone scams and when we're talking about email scams, they rely on the fact that our seniors are vulnerable, that they want to speak to someone, uh, that they might not have any family or friends that are around um, to speak with them during the daytime. So I'm going to just cover with you uh, what rights victims of crime in the state of Pennsylvania have, an overview of our services, and then also uh, looking at the examples of the common scams that we are seeing on a daily basis. So before I start, I would be remiss not to say that we are able to provide these free and confidential services to all of our seniors uh, through several funding streams. Uh, one of the main ones being the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. There are two funding streams, RASA, which is Rights and Services Act, which is state funding, and then also the Victims of Crime Act, VOCA, which is federal funding, and also with support from the County of Delaware. So you heard District Attorney Wayland say that Senior Victim Services has joined in 2015 after the nonprofit organization had dissolved. Uh, while it is a very new entity, uh, we've been able to serve a significant number of victims and help them seek compensation, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Uh, some of the services that we provide are not just for victims of crime, but for individuals that might be a victim of crime in the future. Um, so again, those that are susceptible to any of the telephone calls, telemarketing scams, uh, but also their family members as well. I'll refer to significant others in the presentation, and that means any family, um, not necessarily an intimate relationship, uh, but we are able to work with those individuals too. And one of the most important things that we do is offer our victims a comprehensive plan to provide them with other services that are available throughout Delaware County. We are very fortunate here in Delaware County, uh, as some of the surrounding counties have a blanket victim service organization, uh, which means they serve victims of sexual assault, domestic violence, elderly crimes, all under one agency, typically a nonprofit. Because we have such a significant number of seniors, we're able to have our Senior Exploitation Unit and Senior Victim Services Unit. And at the end of the presentation, I have a list of other victim service agencies that we have right here in Delaware County. Uh, we really rely on these agencies because our advocates within our office will provide these services that you'll see, but let's say that someone is a victim of a domestic assault, then we'll be able to refer them to other victim service agencies. So, I'm not going to read down to you the next three slides, um, but I did want you to become familiar with something called the Pennsylvania Victims Bill of Rights. So essentially when we work with victims, we let them know that they are entitled to certain things. Those are basic rights. Those include the right to be notified if their case reaches the criminal justice system. Uh, they have the right to be accompanied by a victim advocate, a family member, or a friend during the criminal justice system experience. They also have the right to request for restitution to be ordered from the offender, and also to file for a victim <coughs> compensation claim. Uh, we also assist our victims in writing something called a victim impact statement. That's how the crime has affected the victim. Uh, typically that's used for restitution as well. And so these next two slides are just that. Uh, one of the big things that we really let victims know is that they have the right to be notified if their offender is released from jail. Uh, we do this called through something called the PA Savin or Vinelink Network. So our advocates, um, which I want to introduce to you before I go any further, uh, Jennifer Henley and Julia Patterson are two of our victim advocates uh, that work with our seniors on a daily basis. So what Julia and Jennifer are able to do is over the phone, or if they are with the victim in court, they're able to sign them up for the PA Violence system. And so what that does is that provides our victims with the ability to receive a text message, a phone call, or even an email, letting them know of a status change. That could be a work release, that could be a transfer to another facility, or if they escape from the facility as well. Uh, so again, there's the information for you, and it will be on the resource page for you at the end, but it is our statewide victim notification network. So what I really wanna to talk to you all about today is how much this really impacts our seniors. And I think it's important for us to change the conversation. 
and let everyone know that when we're working with those seniors that things such as financial crimes are just as severe as things such as assault, burglary, arson, and the other crimes that we see. Um, in Senior Victim Services, we will work with any type of victim. We will work with a vehicular homicide. Uh, we've had several victims who are victims, uh, survivors of homicide. So let's say that a wife's husband was murdered. We can work with her to seek compensation and really accompany her throughout the criminal justice system. Um, as I said, arson, burglary, identity theft, something called stolen cash, which is essentially theft from the home. So there are a number of services that we will provide. So it's really important because whenever our seniors are victimized, oftentimes we see that they do not have family. They might not have a spouse. And if they do have family, what happens? As you heard Chief Ryan say, it's usually the family member that is stealing from them or is putting them into danger. Uh, harassment. This is really important because we see this when there are telemarketing calls. So I will give you some examples, but if a senior gives money, uh, telephone scam, uh, iTunes gift cards, maybe wires some money, they will continue to receive calls not just from that person that originally scammed them, but they will provide that victim's information to other people. So we see that once our victims are victimized by one scammer, they receive anywhere from five to 10 calls <coughs> over the next few days. And it doesn't go away after a week. And we still have victims that we're working with that are receiving calls even three, four, five months following their original victimization. So there's a continued harassment. It's also important to change the conversation because our seniors have a lot of steps to take whenever they are victimized. Um, whenever you talk to a bank or maybe a credit reporting agency, how many of you have called someone and have been put on hold for a very long time? Sure. It's frustrating for all of us, right? <coughs> Can you imagine how frustrating it is to a senior that has just been victimized, that had all of their money taken, or was physically injured? So it's really important for our advocates to act as that liaison, um, whether it's between the banks, or any of the doctor's offices or hospital systems if they were injured, whether it's the liaison between the criminal justice system or even family members. You heard Chief Ryan say that fear, embarrassment, and shame are the top reasons. We see that on a daily basis. Uh, we have victims that will call us and say, I cannot believe I fell for this. I am so ashamed. And they really will alienate themselves from their families. They will not even tell their family sometimes that they were a victim of a crime. But what the family knows now is there's no money and the senior is struggling. Unfortunately, we see seniors have a snowball effect. So if they had money taken from them, they did not pay their bills. We've had victims that their electricity was shut off or they could not purchase oil and they had no means to get to the grocery store or to even buy food um, for the month. So later on, we'll talk about the community resources on how. Yes. So when you said that um, someone gets victimized and then in subsequent months, there's multiple calls. Yes. Is that from the same entity that's just changing the story or did they just, just now get on a list for other scammers? So essentially it's both. Uh, the first one, it will be that same scammer, um, but what happens is, is they will give the information to other scammers. Uh, sometimes they will sell that information. And you could see that uh, scammers will sit around at a table, just like this, with several different phone lines, and they will all just try because they know that that individual is susceptible to it. Um, we'll see that more whenever in, a victim receives a call and befriends the person on the other line and they'll continue to send them money and that person will call on the day that they receive their social security check. Uh, they know when to call that person for money and they know that that person has done it before and is more likely to do it in the future too. So a little bit of both that we're seeing. Um, difficulty sleeping. Um, again, this is financial crimes, uh, burglaries, any assaults that we see. Uh, we'll have victims that will call us and they will be up all night. Um, they'll try and sleep during the day, but they really don't feel safe in their home, even if they were not home during the time of the crime. So we will uh, talk to you victims. We, as Senior Victim Services, are not clinical counselors, so we do not provide in-house counseling services. However, we do provide uh, crisis counseling or supportive counseling, which means that we'll talk to those victims. We'll work through those issues. Uh, we will safety plan with them. We'll make sure they connect to the resources so that they do feel safe in their own homes. 
um, but unfortunately they do feel unsafe and paranoid. If they receive a phone call and they have all of their money taken or they give all of their information away, they will not trust anyone moving forward. Oftentimes it's difficult for us to even get them to give some of our information because they are so reluctant. Uh, they do not trust their family anymore. Uh, they just do not trust anyone. Um, so those are some things that we see as a common theme with our victims. They relive the victimization. Again, every time that phone rings, is that going to be a scam? Are they going to actually come and get me? Uh, the IRS scams, how many of you have received those? Sure, the sheriff's, <laughs> the sheriff's scams. Uh, our victims, even if they do not send money, they are still victimized. They will call and say, I'm scared that they're going to show up at my house. Uh, they might have your address, they already have your name, your telephone number, probably your date of birth, and they might even have your social security information. So they are afraid, well, even though this is a scam, they still know where I live. Some even know what type of car they drive. So, you know, again, reliving that victimization. And then unnecessary time and expenses. Uh, going back to having to call the banks, having to cancel uh, any transactions, um, having to call a doctor's office uh, to try and seek services. These are all things that we may take for granted every day, but with our seniors, it's really important to provide that advocacy and that support. Uh, we will do three-way calls with our victims. And if they permit us, we will call those places without them on the phone and try to work with them and get really what we need to help either uh, give the exploitation unit the information that they need or help us to process something called a victim compensation claim. So this is just a brief overview of all of the services we provide. Again, I want to stress that all of our services are free to any senior. Uh, we serve individuals over the age of 55. Oftentimes when you think of senior, you will hear 60 or even 65, uh, but we do start our services at 55. Uh, you must reside in Delaware County uh, to receive the services that we are offering. However, we receive a lot of calls from outside counties, Montgomery, Chester, uh, Bucks, even Philadelphia. We are able to provide them with where they should go in each of those counties. Again, every county is different, but we're not going to turn someone away just because they don't live in our county. One of the major services that our advocates will provide, again, is accompaniment. Let's say that an individual is victimized and they have to go file a police report at the police station, but they're intimidated. They don't want to go themselves. <coughs> Our advocates will meet them there. Maybe they have to sit through a law enforcement interview or a lineup. Our, Our advocates are able to accompany our victims. If there is an emergency medical situation, so again, we get a call that someone was victimized and is in the hospital, we'll go there and provide support. Or if they have a doctor's appointment, and they do not have any family or friends that are able to go, our advocates, again, are able to go there with them. One of the other ways that we accompany is to criminal court. Uh, now, this is district court and also to the Court of Common Pleas in the courthouse. So we will meet our victims there. We will make sure that they are signed in. We will talk with the attorney on their case. Uh, we will sit with them. Um, it's really intimidating. How many of you have been in a courtroom? Okay, not so many. So our seniors might have difficulty getting there, transportation-wise, but once they're in there, how do you navigate where you're supposed to go? How do you know when you're supposed to get up? And how are you supposed to talk to someone um, if you don't have that family member that's there? Uh, one of the biggest things that we see is intimidation. Our victims are um, terrified if their offender is going to be there. So our advocates will stand in between uh, the offender and our victim in circumstances such as uh, PFA court, which I'll talk about in a minute. So we're able to provide court accompaniment. Uh, also, uh, assistance with private criminal complaints. If uh, a resident would like to file a private criminal complaint, we will accompany them to the courthouse and actually help them fill out that paperwork. And one of the biggest ones that we see is the protection from abuse orders, or also called the PFAs. So we will receive referrals from the courthouse. Maybe we'll have a call in. We also receive referrals from our local police departments that you heard District Attorney Leland talk about. So we will get a call. Uh, the, ad the advocate will sit with them, whether it's in our office or at the courthouse. They will fill out the 13-page document with them. And then they will go sit in front of a judge uh, to see whether or not they're granted a temporary PFA. And then when there is, or if there is, a permanent PFA court hearing, our advocates will also accompany them to that too. One of the important things is keeping our victims up to date 
on uh, whether or not something is continued or where they're supposed to be and what time they're supposed to be there to. Uh, safety planning, I talked about that. If there is a burglary and uh, locks are broken, we're able to connect them with resources to repair those and hopefully compensate them uh, for that. Uh, transportation support, while our advocates don't transport the victims in their own cars, uh, we do assist them in filling out community transit uh, here in the county. Uh, we'll help them set up their appointments uh, or schedule the community transit. And one of our newest services is able to provide SEPTA transportation tokens. So if a victim has to go to the bank, has to go to court, medical appointments, anything around that victimization, we're able to give them tokens to be able to get there. Um, now, if they are under the age of 65, that is really where we see the need for the tokens. Uh, if they're over the age of 65, then they might take the bus and they're able to ride for free or reduce cost, uh, or a family or friend will take them as well. And then also individual advocacy and support. So one of the other major services that we're able to provide is the Victims Compensation Assistance Program, uh, also known as VCAP. How many of you have heard of VCAP? Oh great, a few of you. Uh, so this depends on uh, what state you're in. There's different uh, guidelines that you have to follow. So I'm covering just here in the state of Pennsylvania. Now while I'm referring to seniors, please know that this compensation program is open to anyone of any age. We specifically help our victims 55 and over to file for them. So the Victims Compensation Program uh, is through the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime and Delinquency. And it's actually funded uh, by offender fees. So when an offender or defendant is uh, ordered restitution and also court fees, uh, part of that, usually it's $35, actually goes into this pot of VCAP funding. Uh, so it's not taxpayer dollars that pay our victims through the VCAP program. Uh, it's essentially the fines and penalties uh, from our offenders. So I joined the district attorney's office in September of 2015. Uh, since then, we've had our advocates join. Um, I'm pleased to say that our advocates in the last 11 months have been able to get our victims over $60,000 in just victim's compensation. Uh, that doesn't include restitution, too. Um, so there is a need. Unfortunately, a lot of victims do not know that this is an option. If you would take a look at the Victims' Compensation Manual, it's about 135 pages. Uh, there's a lot of stipulations, a lot of details. So to give someone that information and say, here, please file a claim, it can be very difficult. Um, so our advocates know the VCAP program inside and out, um, how many expenses, and what exactly they're eligible for. So I'll go a little bit more into VCAP in a few slides for you. Again, restitution, uh, making sure that the, if there is restitution that's ordered, uh, not only assisting them with writing their statements, uh, but ensuring that those payments are coming through. Um, unfortunately, restitution can take a very long time, uh, especially if the offender is incarcerated. So the VCAP program provides those victims with a uh, more timely amount of money um, instead of waiting for restitution. So again, I've already mentioned about the victim impact statement, uh, pre and post sentencing notifications, and then again, just the uh, victim's bill of rights that we covered. So the VCAP program, uh, the VCAP program is a pair of last resort. Does everyone know what that means? So our victims have to exhaust all other options of payment before filing a claim with the victim's compensation program. <coughs> uh, the crime has to have occurred in Pennsylvania. Now, if you live in Delaware County, but you were victimized in Philadelphia, we can still assist you in filing those victims' compensation claims. Uh, you must file a police report. Uh, this is really important. When we go out and talk to our seniors, we let them know. Uh, we talk to them, we understand that there's that fear, embarrassment, and shame. But in order to seek any compensation, whether it's now or two years from now, or within two years, there must be a police report or they're not eligible. So sometimes what happens is the victim will be victimized, call into our office, and say, I'm not filing a police report. And we say, that's okay. Um, we encourage you to, but we understand where you're coming from. What do you think happens after three, four conversations with that person? They usually file. And we'll usually let the police department know they're coming or go with them if they feel comfortable. Uh, so it's really important that you file. Um, furthermore, you have to file within 72 hours of the crime. 
And there are uh, different ways around this. Uh, let's say that if someone was victimized in September, but they didn't discover it until October or November, that's okay. Uh, what they will do is they'll sit with a victim advocate, write a brief statement that we will send over to the program. Uh, the claim also has to be filed within two years. Uh, so we've been doing presentations and we've had victims that are sitting in the audience and say, this happened to me a year and a half ago and I had no idea. I didn't know this was available. I didn't know these services were here. And so we'll actually start working with that victim and a year and a half later we'll file the claim. As long as it's filed within two years, they're still eligible for compensation. Uh, they must cooperate with authorities. Uh, typically this isn't an issue, but sometimes with our seniors, uh, if there are family members that are involved that are, have a um, ear on the senior and they'll talk to them, uh, sometimes they choose uh, not to cooperate. And unfortunately that deems them ineligible for the victim's compensation program. There also must be no illegal activity. Um, I'll give you an example, if a victim was involved um, or in the process of a robbery um, but was never convicted, the police report will still indicate that and the VCAP program will not grant them. Um, so again, it's not us that makes the decision, uh, it's ultimately the Pennsylvania Commission on Crime Difficulty. And each victim over their life uh, is eligible for up to $35,000 through the VCAP program. And on the next slide, you'll see what exactly is covered. Uh, this does not include counseling expenses. So I said we do not provide in-house counseling services. However, we always encourage our victims to seek counseling services. If they do, that's an additional up to $5,000 or even $6,000 outside of the $35,000. Uh, there is no reimbursement for pain and suffering, and there also is no reimbursement for property damage or stolen property. Um, so oftentimes we'll get um, incident reports about cars being damaged or vandalized, um, their housing property. Unfortunately, we cannot file a claim um, for those victims. But again, we will help them safety plan and we'll connect them with any other resources that they might need. So these are really the big, um, the big categories that the VCAP program covers. And again, when a victim works with our advocates, our advocates will pinpoint what exactly that they're eligible for. Uh, very rarely do you have a victim that reaches that $35,000 limit. So I should say that if they file a claim within two years of the, the victimization, they can continue applying for funds from the VCAP program even five years down the road. Um, so I'll give you an example. We had a victim um, that was, um, she was getting groceries out of her car and um, she was robbed and she was also shot. Um, she was paralyzed as a result of the incident. So she had filed a claim and received a significant amount of money from the VCAP program uh, for medical bills, counseling, and also equipment because she was now paralyzed. Um, we did not hear from her. Uh, she worked with the old agency. Um, three years later, came back because some of that equipment started to break. We were able to pick up where that had left off and get her to her $35,000 maximum compensation. So again, although you have to file over the course of their life until they reach 35,000, they are eligible. So medical expenses, um, this can include um, stolen uh, prescription drugs if they were recently filled. Uh, we've had a few of those where um, they were robbed on the way home or getting out of their car. Uh, also, we will help get um, any hospital bills, emergency bills. Um, in addition to that, we also do transportation assistance. So mileage to get from the hospital or to different doctor's appointments. And while that might seem small, over time it adds up especially if our victims are going two to three times, and typically they go to Philadelphia um, or other major areas uh, to seek their medical care. So we're able to submit for medical expenses. Again, counseling services. Uh, loss of earnings or loss of support. So I'll give you an example. I had a, a victim that was um, robbed and assaulted, and as a result, he's no longer able to work, and there was damage to his hand um, from a stabbing and he had his own business and could no longer operate it. He was eligible up to $16,000 within that month to get loss of earnings. So different situations like that. Uh, funeral costs, if it's a victim of a homicide, we will help pay for or have them seek compensation for anything from uh, cards 
to doves, to the actual burial expenses, uh, clothing for the services, the food for the services, and supplies. Now keep in mind when we say this, everything has to be itemized and tracked by the victim. So we'll help them go through and see what they have. Uh, we'll conduct home visits to make sure that they don't have to come out to us, especially if they're home. Uh, child care, if there is child care that's required as a result of the victimization, the VCAP program will reimburse for that. Uh, stolen cash is probably the biggest one that we see right next to medical expenses. And that's essentially if someone is um, scammed out of any money or actually has cash that's stolen uh, and checks that are stolen as well. Uh, relocation, uh, we see this in domestic incidents. Uh, we will have an individual that has to move after they were assaulted and they are eligible up for up to $1,000 for relocation expenses. Um, crime scene cleanup, self-explanatory, and then other costs. So again, um, eyeglasses, if eyeglasses were broken um, in a circumstance, if, if they have mileage, all of those things are included within that category. So the main one, a VCAP for scams. So you're probably thinking, how are we going to get money back for someone if they were scammed? Uh, so what we do is we file a stolen cash um, claim so the only stipulation with this is that if the individual is under 60 years old, it has to be a minimum loss of $100. Um, sometimes when we see that cars are broken into, that it might be a $20 loss, um, maybe an $80 loss. Unfortunately, we're not able to do that. Um, the expense has to be at minimum 100 If they're over 60, they could file for a $5 claim if they wish to. Uh, their primary source of income with stolen cash has to be one of the following. Uh, typically, we see social security, disability, pension, um, railroad, uh, child support, spousal support. As long as their income, 50% of their income, comes from one of these sources, they are eligible to file for a claim. Now, we have victims that will work part-time, but still receive this. Again, if it's 50%, they can still file a claim. Uh, they can receive up to one month of their combined income. So unfortunately, if someone was defrauded of $30,000, we're not going to be able to get them that much, even though the maximum compensation for VCAP overall is $35,000. Uh, we're only able to get them up to one month. So let's say they make $1,800 between Social Security and pension, and they lost $2,000, we'd try to get back that $18,000. Um, and again, that minimum is $100 if they're under 60. Uh, the other thing that we have to do, and this is what our advocates will do for our victims, is contact the insurance companies to ensure that their homeowners or renters does not cover that stolen cash. They also have to provide tax returns from that year or the previous year if they do file taxes. And then they also have to provide income verification. So let's say there's Social Security and pension, they would need their benefit letters or just a bank statement from the month of the crime. Uh, so we compile all of that in addition to the incident report, and we will file their claim and send it into the compensation program. Quick question. Yes. If you have a couple, I'll say a married couple, yes. who are involved in a scam, yes. would you file for both so that you could at least double that amount if they have like a joint checking account or something like that? So uh, typically they do not um, allow that, but if on the police report it indicates that both were victimized and there was a substantial amount of money and they can prove that it was taken from both of them, then they will look at that. Uh, there are different circumstances where we'll apply for a claim and then they'll work with the victim and also the police department to make sure that uh, if that would be an option. So um, one of the things too is uh, iTunes gift cards. So I asked how many of you were scam or received scam, scam calls um, from the IRS or the Sheriff's Departments. Uh, one of the biggest ones that we're seeing is iTunes gift cards, and they want you to read the numbers. We've had victims give anywhere from $2,000 to $10,000 total in iTunes gift cards. They will read the numbers off the back. Um, typically that would be considered property, but because there's such, such a substantial amount of victims that are being scammed this way, the VCAP program is actually starting to look at that um, to get some of that reimbursement. Uh, as long as they can prove that they went out, bought the iTunes gift cards, and then immediately sent it over, uh, whether it's a wire transfer or over the phone, and they have those receipts, uh, those are potentially eligible for compensation too. Could you explain that? I'm sorry? Could you explain the iTunes scam? Sure, and actually I'm going to give you an example okay. in a minute here, so we'll talk about okay. that. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up, uh, two things actually, with fraud alert and also do not call list. 
Um, so some victims that we talk to are very, very frustrated because they receive these phone calls all of the time. And they say, why can't you do anything about them? Why can't they stop? And we understand that frustration. Um, so we always suggest to sign up individuals for the do not call list. However, the do not call list does not prevent scams. Um, the do not call list focuses on telemarketing sales. And sometimes there are illegal robocalls around the do not call list as well. So even if you're on the do not call list, there is a chance that you're still going to receive those scam calls. However, this is one way that we can help to get uh, individuals numbers off of those lists um, to kind of help deter those. Um, so there's some information for you. Um, now this does not, once you sign up for it, we can do it online, we can do it for you over the phone, um, but they do not take your number off unless it's reassigned or deactivated. Uh, your number will stay on there as long as you'd like. And obviously you have a choice to remove it for you too. And this is just the information for the fraud alert that Chief Ryan had talked about with Experian, TransUnion, and Equifax, uh, both their number and also the website for you. Uh, you're able to place a free 90-day alert, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, for your credit report. Uh, there's also something called an extended credit report, which lasts for up to seven years. Uh, we'll assist the victims in compiling any letters to the credit agencies. We'll also gather the incident report and send that all over to them. If they do place a seven-year extended uh, fraud alert, they do require that police report too. So again, just making sure we're advocates for our victims. So um, how to recover the FTC, or if you visit ftc.gov, they provide a lot of great information. Again, we'll help our victims connect with these resources. It's really important to file a local police department, uh, but you can also file an FTC consumer complaint uh, right online. We know that a lot of our seniors do not have access to the internet or do not have a computer, so again, those are services we're able to do for them. Um, they really want to make sure that they remove bogus charges, um, making sure that they're checking their credit reports on a regular basis. And when Chief Ryan was talking about the accounts in Macy's, we actually had a victim that didn't even know that she was a victim of identity theft years later. She looked at her credit report, said, I check it every month, I'm great. And then she said, well, when I was going down through it, after we talked, she had two Macy's accounts, accounts on there. Um, and she said, you know, I didn't even think anything of it because I have a Macy's account. But here, they were two different accounts. Uh, so, so someone had opened it in her name and she didn't even, she didn't even know. Um, so making sure that you're removing that, making sure that you're alerting not just uh, the credit reporting agencies, but also the banks as well. So um, I just want to go over a few of the cases. Again, we see a lot in regards to uh, assault and domestic violence issues as well. But some of the main ones are coming from um, telemarketing and also online. Uh, so this is one of the ones that just came, just came through our office not too long ago. With the holidays, make sure you're keeping an eye out for these or let your loved ones know. So the secret shopper. How many of you know what a secret shopper is? Someone that is paid to go out and provide information to a company. A legitimate thing, right? Except for now they're using it as a scam. So we will have scammers that will, will send an email to our victims or they'll call and say, you're a secret shopper, here's all of your information. So they are actually sent a check, and I don't know if anyone has ever seen the checks that are coming through from our scammers, but they are really good. They come from the Wells Fargo letterhead, the PNC letterhead, and really, unless you see a typo or you're looking closely at it, sometimes it's difficult to see that it might just be a scam. It has the watermark and everything. Uh, and it's not until a few days later when the bank calls and says they were bad checks that our victim actually knows that they have been a victim. So they are sent a check and told to deposit that check. And they do just that. They'll deposit the check. They will say, send us $1,000. You keep 500 And then when you complete your task, we're going to send you more. So what happens is they cash that check, they take out that money, and then they collect the information they're supposed to. Um, this victim was supposed to go to a Walmart and send money from a Walmart to another Walmart, uh, measure their hospitality or their customer service, and then also say how long they waited in line. Provided them with a sheet and everything. Turned it in, sent the money they were supposed to, found out two days later when he was sent another check, that they were bad checks. So not only did he not have that money, but now his bank account was negative um, because the bank was holding him accountable for that money as well. Unfortunately, we see that with a lot of our victims too. 
so that is the secret shopper scam. Uh, really keep an eye out for that. Um, with the iTunes gift cards, uh, we had a victim that was sent a check, and then he was told to go purchase some iTunes gift cards, read over, you know, the um, the numbers on the back of the card, and he said to me after, he said, you know, I thought I won. It's been a rough few years. I thought that I finally my luck turned around. I couldn't really remember if I entered anything, um, but it seemed legitimate. And then he was negative in his bank account as well. And it took him six months to even try to keep his head above um, in terms of the financial loss that he had. And then afterwards, he still had that residual feeling of, am I being scammed? Who can I trust? And he didn't have any family members. Um, so we are seeing it uh, very, very often. You heard Chief Ryan talk about the grandparent scam. Uh, again, we see this pretty often. Uh, a lot of family members will say to us, well, how did you fall for that? How did you fall for that? You know what your grandchildren sound like. Well, we've heard everything from, I ran into the back of a car and the airbag hit my nose and I'm congested. Or they'll call and, and be screaming, I'm in trouble, I'm hurt. And of course, when you all receive a call from your family that's urgent, immediately, we're on alert, right? Well, we're not sure. We don't take time to say, okay, let me check and make sure that person's actually okay. It's not until after that happens that our seniors realize, well, maybe I should call their mom or their dad or their aunt and make sure that it is them. And what do you think happens when they do? It wasn't them. They didn't even know that they were on vacation or that they were out of town. Um, so the grandparent scam is, we're seeing more and more of these over the last um, few months and now moving into the holiday season as well. Uh, so just make sure that you're keeping an eye out for that and make sure, as Chief Ryan said, that they are asking information that only that person would know. The online dating scam, how many of you have heard of this one? So before this wasn't as big of an issue with our seniors as it would be with anyone else, right? Um, we've got several cases uh, with online dating scams. Uh, using sites like Match.com, uh, OkCupid, uh, sites that everyone else uses. And why are our seniors going on there? Friendship, maybe a romantic relationship? Absolutely, the same reasons that everyone else does. Uh, unfortunately, what happens is the scammers on the other side of the computer are not who they say they are and they will really target our seniors uh, because our seniors, they're not lying on their profiles. They're putting their names, maybe their location, they're putting their ages. Uh, so we have scammers that are going specifically for them. Uh, so far as to befriending them for six, seven, eight months, and then forming a, a romantic relationship uh, online, even telephone calls with them, and promising to come visit them if they don't want to meet well, then one day, they get a phone call and something's wrong. Uh, we've had scammers say that they have cancer. We've had scammers say that their uh, grandchild or their son or daughter uh, was in the hospital and they needed money. They promised to pay it back. I can't wait to see you in a month. I'm flying to visit you. And what happens? Our seniors are generous. And again, they're vulnerable. And they have really formed a connection with this person, whether it is a friendship or a romantic connection. So they're sending money, and then that person deactivates all of their accounts, uh, blocks any numbers, does not have a valid email address, and then our victims are left um, with no ability to track that person or that money as well. Um, so that individual would be eligible for the VCAP program uh, as long as they meet all of the requirements as well. And um, one of the other popular ones that we see is the you won scam, so the lottery scams, um, probably one of the most popular. The iTunes gift cards are what we see with the you won scam. So you're getting a letter in the mail, again, same circumstance, you're receiving a check, please deposit this check and send the tax money over and then we're going to send you the rest of the money. Again, our seniors might enter into contests, they oftentimes give to charities, so it wouldn't be abnormal to receive something that they won. Before, you were, you were seeing that uh, you've won $30,000 or you've won a million. Well, now we're starting to see you've won $3,000. It's a little more believable, right? Once they send that money, again, difficult to track, um, oftentimes not able to come back, and the bank is not liable uh, to give our victims that money. So we always say, if it's too good to be true, it is, especially with the you've won scams. 
So, in addition to working directly with our victims, we want to make sure that they do receive all of the services that they're entitled to. Uh, within our community, these are just a few of several, uh, but these are ones that we receive referrals from or give re referrals to. Uh, court financial services, uh, we work with them very closely in regards to restitution for our victims. Uh, Delaware County Office of Services for the Aging, which Chief Rag had mentioned earlier. Um, COSA is really wonderful. They act as our area um, on aging. They provide uh, protective services. services. And they also provide um, something called the Ombudsman Program, which will go into nursing home or facilities and really be an advocate within that area for those victims. Uh, they also provide a, a program called Gateway um, that evaluates mental health services. Uh, they will do in-home assessments, both through protective services, but also, let's say I'm working with a victim and they're not in any danger, but they could use some light housekeeping, um, maybe someone to be in the home two, three days a week. So we'll make a referral to COSA, get all of their information, because it is a lengthy process. Uh, so sometimes they tell our seniors to make that call or to send in a sheet. Oftentimes we find that they do not do that. Um, so making sure that we are calling them, reminding them, and actually doing that for them. Uh, when that happens, COSA will send someone out to do an evaluation and determine which of the many programs that they offer that that victim's eligible for. I know earlier a question was uh, whether or not money uh, was an issue with services. Um, again, no, with most of COSAs. Uh, there are some financial uh, sliding scales that they'll use for things like in-home care. Um, but again, that's something that the assessor will determine when they go and visit um, the victim's home or the consumer's home. Uh, Delaware County Women Against Rape and also the Domestic Abuse Project of Delaware County are two agencies that we work very closely with. Uh, let's say there was an assault with one of our seniors, uh, maybe it was their husband or their wife, and we will work with them, but we'll also refer them to DEF to make sure that they receive all of those services, uh, such as counseling. Uh, family support line, uh, we will receive referrals or make referrals to uh, if there are children that are involved in the situation. Uh, mothers Against Drunk Driving, and also Parents of Murdered Children. Uh, again, we work with survivors of homicide, which is where those agencies would come into play. And then just the General Victim uh, Witness Assistance Unit that's within the Delaware County uh, Office. So just some additional community resources. As I said, when a victim uh, is scammed out of money, they're unable to pay their bills, there might be other circumstances that arise, our advocates are able to connect them with those services. Uh, community Transit, uh, the LIHEAP program, which is Low Income Housing and Energy Assistance Program, uh, Home Weatherization, which leads into Community Action Agency of Delaware County, um, will work with the Center for the Blind and the Visually Impaired, uh, which is housed in Chester, uh, the County Assistance and Department of Public Welfare, uh, Legal Aid of Southeastern Pennsylvania, uh, and also the Crisis Connection Teams. Um, oftentimes we'll receive a victim that uh, in addition to needing a referral to COSA and um, going through the court system and working with our advocates that there might be a need uh, or a circumstance where they have a crisis uh, whether we're on the phone with them or they're at their house as well so we'll refer to our county's uh, crisis connections team so just to really wrap up everything um, some tips that we always say again I can't stress enough making sure that you're reporting it um, to the local police department. Um, but calling our office, that's our number there. The table outside is full of resources and giveaways. Please take that. Uh, pass that on to anyone that you would know. You can always visit the Delaware County District Attorney's Office um, homepage. Uh, you really need to be supportive and understanding. Um, we will be that buffer again with families, um, with victims that have been victimized and their families just can't understand. Um, it's important that we do understand. We understand that it might take them um, a little longer to get over their victimization um, because it's not something that's just one and done, especially with our financial crimes. Um, oftentimes, our victims might be uh, widowers and um, might have some depression, and then on top of that, they're victimized. Um, a lot of different issues to look into. Connect them with available resources. Help them to recover. Um, don't just tell them you need to do this, but actually assist them during that process. Um, give them someone to talk to. Have them call us. Uh, you know, have them talk to our advocates. If you receive a letter in the mail, your loved one receives a letter in the mail, and it looks legitimate, but you're just not sure, better safe than sorry. 
call Julia, call Jennifer, call myself. Uh, we'll talk you through that. Um, again, we'll meet you somewhere if you need to. There's a lot out there. Um, make sure you're safeguarding your personal information. Make sure you're shredding. Those phishing emails that you're getting, don't open the link. Uh, what happens when you click that link? Sometimes they can begin to record your keystrokes. They get all of your personal banking information um, just from an email. So make sure that you're shredding things. Uh, make sure that you're not giving out your personal information. You might receive a phone call and they know your name, date of birth, address, again, car, everything. And they say, well, can you just confirm? We have the other numbers, but what are the last four of your social? After that conversation, that senior has already built trust. Oh, well, it's one, two, three, four. They have all of your personal information now. Um, so making sure that our seniors know. Um, making sure they're not carrying their social security cards in their purses um, or their wallets. Um, making sure that if they are somewhere that they're holding on to their items. Uh, around the holiday season, we get a lot of police reports of um, wallets being taken out of purses um, or even their back pockets while they're at the mall or eating lunch in a local restaurant. Um, so just making sure that they're aware of their surroundings. Uh, the credit card swiping uh, skimmers that Chief Ryan reviewed, a lot of those too. Gas stations, ATMs, make sure that our loved ones are kind of pulling that out. Uh, we've formed a lot of great relationships with um, our banks and local organizations so that if they're seeing that our seniors are coming in and withdrawing lots of money um, or giving away their information, then they are more likely to um, contact someone, um, whether it's Protective Services or um, one of our detectives, to let them know that it's a little bit of a red flag. Okay, and like I said, here's just some of the resources for you. And I believe Nancy is posting them on the website as well, so um, all of this information will be there for you. And so that's all I have for you today. So any questions, right? Are you able to share this information? I mean, there's a, there's a lot here that I'm, maybe some of us aren't, aren't aware how, how broad it is. Um, so are you able to share how many open cases you kind of have at this point? Sure. That's a, that's a great um, point. I can tell you just from July until October, so that quarter, uh -huh. uh, we served over 260 new victims. 260? Uh, 260. Uh, again, we just uh, began under the district attorney's office in September of last year. Uh, but in that first fiscal year, we served over 420. Um, so again, you can see that now that we're getting out in the community, that more individuals are knowing uh, that the Senior Exploitation Unit is doing those presentations, more individuals are identifying as victims. Uh, so again, we're seeing um, a few hundred every few months. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we would like to ask District, excuse me, District Attorney Whalen, uh, Chief Ryan, and uh, Director Price to be able to answer any questions uh, that folks may have. This is the Q and A period. I don't know if anyone had any questions in your cards to bring up. Um, one thing we do want to let you know, um, as was mentioned. On your agenda at the bottom, you'll see that it says website and presentation materials. Please feel free to go on that link. The information will be available to you online there. And I also recommend that you um, look through this website because there are quite a few other district attorney initiatives and county initiatives that are included on that page talking about public safety. Um, a, an additional reminder is, uh, as District Attorney Whalen had mentioned earlier, on the 13th, which is uh, the, it's a Tuesday in two weeks from 9 to 12 we will be talking about um, cyber issues and cyber crimes that will be over at the Mullen Center which is right across the way um, the new communication center there I would recommend uh, to you as well it's the same uh, group of experts uh, similar uh, levels of experience and uh, we would love to um, have you there uh, we would also ask that Whatever materials you may need, um, is if, as you were discussing, sir, you know, the need for additional materials, feel free to reach out to um, the Center for Leadership and we'll be happy to point you in the necessary direction to get additional materials that you might need. Um, so now we would like to, again, be able to, we have our esteemed panel here that we would like to um, be able to answer any questions that you, you may have. So, okay. there, was, there was something I thought I heard um, about uh, skimmers, yes. That most 
Most ATM or all ATMs, not most, all ATMs will have some form of green light that is there where you put your card in. And if you, so if you're, so if you're, if it's your bank that you go to all the time, you know that's fine. But if you're all of a sudden traveling in a different state, and you, and you, you know you're strapped for cash and you want to go, that that I, I heard that um, you should look for a green light at an ATM. And if there is no green light, that's usually a bit of a red flag that there potentially could be a skimming device on top of it. I'm not Sound familiar, familiar with that, but I'll defer to Tony and your uh, building. You guys hear that? I've never heard such a thing. Yeah, I, I, I actually heard from a bank bank person, and it, I've it, seen it. I've actually made a note to I, notice I, that. You say that. I've, I've been at machines that have a green light, light around it, but I can't say that that's an indicator. It may be something as a safeguard. It's, it, it's yeah. Taking hold now, but I, right. I mean, as far as I, I, something I haven't heard. Of, yeah, I, I had to. I'm reason I had to give an identity theft talk in a library to seniors, and I actually went to a couple of banks and asked them because they do they do them as well for their right. customers, especially banks right. nowadays. It's more of a community feel, and that was from three different banks. Uh, that was the comment they made to me. When there were machines. Yes, which, and, and it's only it's just ATMs. I mean, you can't we can't do anything about gas, you know, gas pumps and things of that sort. But but the point of the story is for people who are traveling. So if they're at a Wells Fargo bank in North Carolina versus Pennsylvania, that they should be looking for some kind of green light or a green flashing light right, at an right. ATM machine. So I thought I didn't know whether you heard that or not. One of the things we always tell people though, is don't use the private ATMs. I think the freestanding ones you see at. Uh, 7-Eleven? Restaurants, uh, I don't know about 7-Eleven, 7 7-Elevens 7 are connected to a bank. You go to Wawa, they're connected to PNC, they're a bank. There's freestanding ones, you know, you'll go to a, a bar and they'll have a, if they're all privately owned, you don't really know who's getting your uh, information. They're not going through a bank, it's a private product. Okay. They charge $10 transaction. <laughs> <laughs> So, so. Yeah, I work with the church and the homebound and the, most of the seniors and the people that I find they kind of uh, have a trust for the church and uh, they get information from the bulletin. So it's from this team I you were going to reach out to those, uh, to the churches and to mm -hmm. let them know that there are those resources out there. So that uh, those are frequent questions. I see the call, the updates, and we try to say so to connect them to the resources in the churches. Mm -hmm. Thank you. That's a wonderful suggestion. And we do do that. I mean, we, we have a relationship with uh, various churches and ministers throughout okay. Delaware County, uh, especially in the city of Chester, Sharon Hill, for example. We were just at a church in Sharon Hill last week, and so we. We have a pretty aggressive community program where we're constantly going to senior centers, to churches, to different community groups, uh, giving them the information that they need as to how to avoid becoming a victim and addressing certain issues that they have. I also want to take the opportunity, which I should have done earlier this morning, is to introduce Erica Parham. Erica is an assistant district attorney, a great trial attorney in our office, and works with seniors every single day, and she's head of the senior exploitation unit. So Erica, thank you for everything that you do. Um, it's not uncommon for folks, especially in early stage dementia, to start losing things or misplacing things, including wallets and IDs. So how do you balance, or how, what would you recommend to balance that need to put freezes on everything versus, gee, it really may turn up someplace in a week or so? Um, particularly if you have seniors who don't have internet access, don't have all of that, so it really becomes an involved endeavor to replace things or to unfreeze things? Any Generally, what I would do with that is, um, I would, first of all, I would, and this is a good idea for uh, most people, if you have a, like, a safe location where like it's people use iPads and have passwords, and, and, but there's so many passwords we use today. And there's so much information out there, uh, and, and they're changing passwords, and, and so you want to keep um, either in a secure spot where you have complete confidence, uh, all this information, if you have credit cards in your wallet, if you have uh, passwords, all of that on a list of, uh, it could be inside an iPad that you know you're not going to, that password's not going to be forgotten, uh, but you want to be able to do that. I don't have any hesitation to 
if you can't find a, a, if you know that the person was out of the house with the wallet or with the credit cards, then I think you need to cancel it right away. I wouldn't use any delay time. Um, but if you don't cancel it, I'm sure what you've heard today is that you've, you, you know, on credit cards, we're, we're worried about debit cards, but on credit cards, you cannot be held liable uh, if somebody fraudulently uses the credit card. So it's a, it's a hassle, it's demanding for you to correct it and to fill out the affidavits of forgery and send them back to the credit card company. But for the most part, you can't be held responsible. So you want to keep credit cards and use credit cards instead of debit cards. You don't want to give your PIN number on a debit card to anybody, but all that information should be kept pretty secure, pretty conf uh, uh, confidential. And then if you do lose, this, if you lose your debit card, you lose your credit card, you can go back, find the credit card number, the number of the company the, next to it. You should have your credit card name, the number of the credit card, the phone number to call to cancel it, so that a lot of times you lose your credit card, well, the number to call is on the back of the credit card. Mm -hmm. So you want to make sure you have that in a separate location so you can go ahead and do that. And they usually will give you a credit card within pretty fast, especially if you use it, they, they wanted you to have that credit card, so they're going to get it to you pretty fast. And if not, you can actually pay for it to be overnighted to you if you wanted to have that credit card overnight. So I, I would be cautious on that. And, and uh, um, you know, people that don't have dementia lose things all the time, and so, you know, so it happens. And they blame them. <laughs> so a question I think is similar to what you were mentioning about the loss of a, a car. What, what do you do when you are, when you do have a family member, you know someone that's a victim? What, what's the first step you can take to? Well, secure the rat. First of all, you want to see what, what they're victimized as. If, it's, if, if, if you know someone stole somebody's wallet, uh, it could be you left your wallet in, in the car and you go out to the car the next morning. And unfortunately, we're seeing a lot of that across the county. We have, unfortunately, a, a drug addiction problem in, in, in this community as well as every community in Pennsylvania and almost every community across the country, it's sad to say. But um, if that happens, you come out and, and, and your car has been vandalized um, and there's been a theft. You certainly, again, it goes back to saving that information. It makes your life a lot easier to go back in the house, pull up your iPad, if that's what you have, or a separate indication, like hidden somewhere in your house, where you have all those numbers, where you can go in and start canceling them easily. And then you want to, of course, report it to the police. Um, I always say that if it's not an emergency, then in, in a relatively short and reasonable period of time, call the police, but let's start canceling those cards right away, because if that person took that uh, within hours of, of you discovering it, they're going, the first thing they do is try to test the credit card and see if it works. So they'll go to a gas station, for example, and we've talked about gas stations here today. Um, they'll swipe the card to see if they can fill up their tank. Now, some of the gas stations have gotten smarter where you got to put in the zip code, but they know typically if they hit the card there and that, if, if it's an Aston, for example, and, and they the bur they know your card's coming back to probably your residence, of course, and so they're going to try that zip code for Aston, put that in there, and then they're going to get their first score. Um, they're going to get a full tank of gas. Then they're going to start using that as fast and, and as possible to start ordering or however they're going to start going into a store and merchandise. Uh, so you want to try to cancel that right away um, so that you can stop that from happening. And then, of course, report it to the police. The police are going to come. They're going to take a report. Um, they're not going to be able to do a lot typically in those type of cases. They may uh, dust the car for fingerprints. They, they may have a suspect in the neighborhood that may be burglarizing, or I shouldn't use that word, but uh, stealing, breaking into cars, car type of thefts. Burglarizing is when they're actually going into your house, and hopefully that doesn't happen because it's a much worse crime to have, a, uh, to have someone come into your house to steal your pocketbook or any type of merchandise that you may have. So hopefully that, that addresses it. Um, it seems like a lot of these crimes are committed by family members who, you know, have drug addictions and are trying to get money for that. And eventually, I think that some families realize that it was actually a family member. How do you deal with that, and what's the best approach? I mean, a family member, I guess, family probably doesn't want to press charges because they offend that person's mother, or you know, it causes a rift in the family. So, what's the how do you deal with that? Well, we, we talk to the family, obviously, and we, we make a determination whether it's in their best interest. And that, well, I'm going to respect the families. You know, they're in a bad situation. If, 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 the, if, if the nephew, the grandson um, stole, and, and this comes up quite often, actually. It's, it's, it's not something that we don't see. Uh, we see it often. 
um, there is a gambling or a drug problem, more likely today a drug problem, and they uh, go in and, and, and get access to, to grandmom's uh, uh, account, and they start taking out of it. Now we recommend that we could prosecute. We, we tell them that uh, if we get them in the criminal justice system, one of the things we're going to do, we can prosecute them, we can try to get them drug rehabilitation help uh, in the system, but uh, we recommend now if, 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 if they're dead set against it, they don't want any part of it, I'm not going to force uh, grandmother or, or mom or dad to, to prosecute uh, their relative, um, but we tell them that they certainly need help. It's going to continue. It never usually ends there, and that's a, it usually gets worse. So we catch them one time. Uh, it, it's, it's usually going to be multiple times that this is going to occur in the future. And unless they get their uh, drug rehabilitation and try to get back on the right track, uh, they're still trying to feed their problem, and, and it's going to be a big issue. But yes, we see um, Children taking advantage of mom and dad, or grand uh, sons and granddaughters taking advantage of the grandparents, and it, it's a shame we see a lot of that. And that's why we always tell people that if you're drafting a power of attorney, you want to make sure that the name that you're putting in that power of attorney, the attorney in fact that you're giving that power to, that that person has an awesome responsibility. He's stepping into your shoes. He can take money out of your account. So anybody that you're going to name in that document, you want to make sure that they're trusted. And then if they're, um, and if it's something develops uh, where you don't trust them anymore, you got to make sure you change that document because they have access to all your information in your accounts. Uh, it seems like a lot of the crimes are related to people. Maybe they'll, they'll come to the door, and I just wonder about guidelines in terms of whether people should open the door, never open the door. If you're suspicious, do you report something? Because it, sometimes it's not somebody that's trying to scam you. Or well, I would always, like, first of all, if they come to your door, most municipalities, and I think like here in Aston, for example, you're supposed to register with the township if you're going door to door. Now, with that said, there's some, you know, First Amendment issues and all that with the ability to go and, you know, knock and walk around the neighborhood and all of that, and putting all that aside, they usually want you, to, they don't usually charge a fee for it, but they want you to register, and they call it like a solicitation ordinance that the township has. Because people are going door to door sometimes, and for energy companies we've seen it. Um, sometimes you have your religious groups going door to door, the Jehovah Witnesses type of thing. But you also have your unscrupulous people that are going to go door to door, and they're going to look in, they're going to, they're going to be seeing who's the occupants of the residence, whether it's an elderly couple. We're concerned about that. If you believe if anything becomes suspicious to you, it goes back to that adage where if they uh, see something, say something, that type of uh, uh, motto. And you want to make sure that, that you're, you are reporting suspicious activity. Uh, and the police will make note of it. Usually the, the patrol units will then uh, check the area to see if that person's going door to door. But I think, yes, I think that there's individuals that will knock on a door and with some ruse, typically like, we're, um, you know, we're, we're going door to door, we're taking a survey, or they'll come up with something and they'll interact with you, but really what they're doing is that, that old, um, uh, I guess it's the, the, the word casing. Uh, they're casing really your property in your house and seeing who's there and, and if they really want to um, go in and be victimized. Now it's very dangerous and we take that very serious because that's into robbery and burglary. and They're all felony one crimes. And when we do arrest people for doing that, uh, they go to jail for a long time because there's, you know, there's only there's certain crimes that are, you know, beyond serious. And you got murder, of course, and rape is their number one and number two. And then robbery and burglary are right in there uh, after that because your home is like your castle. You don't want to be victimized in your home. You don't want to be victimized on your property. And it's it, it, we take it serious. So when that does happen, there's serious ramifications. How do you handle crimes when you're so close to, you know, different states, New Jersey, Delaware? How, do, how does that work? And, and uh, when someone is victimized, for example, in, in Pennsylvania, but um, their, their credit cards, their identity it is used in Delaware or New Jersey or some other, some other location, how, how do you guys Sure, that's, that's, that? that happens all the time, too, of course, because, you know, someone steals the pocketbook, they go down to the Jersey Shore and having a good time in Atlantic City or whatever, so that happens, or they cross the border into Delaware, <coughs> we're uh, very close, and actually, you know, within 10 minutes of where we're at right now, we could probably be in Delaware, another 15 minutes in New Jersey, so very often that happens. We do have a great relationship with the law enforcement authorities in Newcastle County, for example, we're constantly working with them, and 
Wilmington, for example, uh, over in Jersey, to the, uh, the police departments over there. So that when, when that occurs, we notify our, our neighboring jurisdictions. Uh, we, we contact them, we work on that together as a, as a, uh, as a joint effort. Um, and we'll go in to prosecute them and then if they catch them in their jurisdiction, if we know who that is, they'll apprehend them there. We have to extradite them back to Pennsylvania, but we will do that on certain crimes. Uh, theft being one of them over a certain amount, so we'll do that. <coughs> Anyone else have any questions? Hearing none, we want to thank so very much the District Attorney's Office, District Attorney Whalen. <laughs> thank you very much for your time today, and uh, please make sure if you are seeking CLE credits that you provide me with the, uh, with the sheet. Feel free to put them on the table on the way out, or you can just leave them on the tables today. Thanks so much, and have a great day, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Jeff.